Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. So, um, welcome everybody to the Crisis Management Symposium that's organized by the MBA program at uh, uh, Mario J. Gabelli School of Business in Roger Williams University. Uh, you know, I just had a moment when we were discussing this with our two amazing keynote speakers for today. Uh, is that, you know, we always learn about all the wonderful things in our MBA program. We learn about how we want to grow our companies, how we want to innovate, how we want to do all the fantastic things. But the one thing that we never want to learn about is that your best laid plans may not work out because of crisis, right? And, and we don't want to think about it, so we often don't teach about it because it's just, you know, who wants to plan for a crisis? But the truth is that there is always crisis, right? And there is always going to be something or the other happening in the world that is impacting us directly or indirectly and that requires some real proactive thinking about what happens when there is crisis. So with that, today I want to thank a few people and get this symposium started. First, I want to thank our two keynote speakers, Dr. Pari Gopalakrishnan and Mr. Basim Naseem for their generosity of time and knowledge and for being here to share their experiences with us. With us, I want to thank the Department of Education for the grant that has actually made both the trip to Greece, immersing ourselves in crisis management as well as you know this symposium possible. Um, I also want to thank Professor Jason Oliver for working with the students tirelessly on making sure that they get this concept and ingrained in them. And like I was talking to the students, it seems like you've got a master's in crisis management and not in business administration right now. Um, I also want to thank a whole bunch of people who have made the event possible today, particularly to Heidi Dagwin and the entire team of events because you know everything coordination is a real big thing and we, they got us this beautiful space, a lovely, uh, breakfast and lunch. Um, I want to thank uh, Bo Gilly, uh, Mary Kate Sandler and Kate Brezina from the advancement team and Dean uh, Gina Bianco of University College for uh, helping and supporting this event a lot and making it possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce and invite our first keynote speaker. Um, you know, if you guys have not heard about him, he's quite the rock star in the world of crisis management. So uh, it's, um, it, and, and I don't know if that's like a nice reputation or, <laughs> or but it is, you know, he's, he's definitely somebody who's been cited multiple times in, uh, in newspapers and in journals to uh, highlight what one has to do when there is a crisis. And his leadership was most recognized at the time when he was um, running the COVID field hospital. And uh, he is, uh, an MD and MBA and is the president of and CEO of the Kent Hospital in Warwick, Rhode Island. And he's going to talk to us about crisis leadership builds character, my growth, leading through a cyber attack and operating a COVID field hospital. I'm not going to go into the details of his biography because it is a lot of amazing achievements, but I do encourage you to read it. It is on your seat. And so uh, I, without wasting more time, I would like to invite Dr. Gopal Krishnan for the first keynote. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I actually really enjoyed um, putting this presentation together because I hadn't um, really reflected back on, on some time. Um, and so I want to, you know, so I, I'm a physician by trade. And, um, you know, in, in, in my world, and I don't know if some of you guys have heard the TV show Scrubs at all. Um, and if you haven't, you should take a look at it. But the main character, JD, is after a resident that I trained with at Brown. Uh, and um, his best friend wrote it. And, and so, so in one, one of the first episodes, um, you know, JD's heard saying running to a code. Code is when somebody's heart stops in the hospital, code blue goes off, and everybody goes into a room to try to resuscitate somebody back. And he's thinking to himself as he's running, here's how it works. Some, someone's heart stops. They beep everyone, the first doctor in has to run the room and tell everyone what to do. Basically decide if somebody lives or dies. What am I, crazy? And then he goes into a closet and one of his co-residents is there, all right? <laughs> and every physician that's ever trained has had this kind of experience, all right? And so what, what happens when you go into some, a code is there's a lot of people in there and it looks like chaos and you're anxious and you don't know what to do. And, and then as you become more, you know, 
in, ingrained and trained, you realize there's a, there's a process to handle that situation. There's a, you know, and that's one of the algorithms, but if there's roles, there's definitions, there's times, and it's really slowing down the crisis. So for some reason, Dr. Das asked me, because I was in one of those closets, to give a kind of talk on crisis. So I don't know what I know about crisis, but I could tell you, I could reflect back on a, a period of time in my career which was really impactful for me um, and has really um, helped me uh, um, grow as a leader. And, and it was through the pandemic, and you know, you really, you test, we were tested quite a bit. Um, you, know, you guys are MBA students, you know, supply chain was a huge issue, communication was a huge issue. Everything that we had known and studied was an issue. And in healthcare, we are, uh, we are the last to do anything, because we want to make sure everything is, is, is safe, safe, safe. We're never going to be the first ones overboard on, on a lot of things, but we had to be during this period. So there's three things that I wanted to kind of show in this, and, and then I'm going to talk, uh, reflect on two aspects of this in, in my career. So this is, um, what this graph represents is the admissions to, uh, of COVID to hospitals in the state of Rhode Island. Right, and you see kind of two peaks in there, and and the first one you see is um, kind of the first first. Uh, well, you see it. <laughs> so uh, over here, so you see um, the first surge was where the the world shut down, right? And the COVID surge happened in the state. The world shut down. Nobody left their house. The hospitals we prepared. It wasn't actually that bad, to be honest with you. The hospital was empty. Um, you know, we had. Um, you know, usually I see about 200 patients in our emergency room every day, we saw like 70. Um, we usually have about 200, 250 patients admitted to our hospital, we had about 80, all right? They were all COVID, but there, were, there wasn't as many patients, right? People weren't getting, at that time. Uh, and, and we stopped all surgeries, because we were all worried, and everybody shut down, everybody went away, and people that needed treatments didn't come to get treatments. So we planned, and we were anxious, but to be honest with you, we handled it just fine. It wasn't a big issue. Um, then, then, as you can see, there was um, a second surge, which happened in you know, fall into the winter of 20 to 2021. It was higher. Nobody was going to shut down at that point, if you guys remember. Nobody, you couldn't tell people to stay in, all right? Because they, they, we're humans, we're not used to being confined, so people were living. Um, and what was happening in the hospitals was we were, we were getting inundated. And the thing about COVID, what would happen when the patient gets admitted for COVID, um, is if they get admit, if they're sick enough to get admitted to, for COVID, it takes them a while to recover, right? So a typical patient that gets admitted to a hospital is like four to five days. That's what our length of stay is. Um, COVID patients would stay for 10, 12, 14, 15 days, right? So when you have a lot of one diagnosis in a hospital, it's a throughput issue. It's a logistics issue, right? All of a sudden, a person is staying two to three times as long as they're supposed to stay. And now you're backed up. So now how do you care for other illnesses? There's other illnesses. People still have heart attacks. People still have strokes. People still have pneumonias. So how do you care for that? And so the so field hospital came out of that to try to decompress the hospitals, all right? And then lucky for me, we ended up with a cyber attack in our health system, right in the middle of that. So as I reflected on a period of time in my life from you know April, March, April of 20 to April of 2021, in that 12 months, I had a uncertainty with uh, COVID in the first surge, a cyber attack, and then a second surge. And so, so I'm gonna try, I, so putting this talk together, I thought about the things that, I'm gonna try to explain um, what we did during those times, and then um, some principles that, that are my principles that I kind of reflect on over that time to see what I learned, all right? So uh, the cyber attack, and I have to tell you, is single-handedly the worst week of my professional career ever. Um, because, um, you know, so I walk into the hospital, I'm early, I'm an early bird, I'm in the hospital usually by like 6, 5.36, 6.30, something like that, and this is on my screen, all right, I'm gonna read it to you, all right, if for some reason you read this text before the encryption ended, this can be understood by the fact that the computer slows down and your heart rate has increased due to the ability to turn it off. Then we recommend that you move away from the computer and accept that you have been compromised. Rebooting shutdown will cause you to lose files without possibility of recovery. Further down says, um, for us, this is just the business. And to prove to you our seriousness, we'll decrypt one of your files for free. <laughs> All right? And so here you are. So that's, that's on every computer in our hospital. All right? 
and 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 we don't know like I, I can tell you right now I know nothing about computers <laughs> I know nothing about cybersecurity I know nothing about uh, how to manage this neither did most people in our in our health system so what happened so our health system got compromised June 16th of 2022 uh, our internal servers go down um, we're all on Everything's computer in a the hospital these days. The notes are on a computer, how we give medications are on a computer, how we read x-rays are on a computer, how we know where people are in the hospital are on a computer. All different programs. All right, so I don't know enough about IT to say exactly how we do this, but what we did, our IT department quickly started forcibly shutting down all, our pro all of our systems to make sure that we couldn't get more compromised. Um, and then we, we brought in an external, you know, this is, this is there's an industry, uh, that we brought in a different company uh, using our uh, our malpractice our uh, insurance company, and we negotiated and we you know got the the way to come back to life, which took about seven to ten days. All right. The problem with this though is the patients' lives are at risk here, right? So so uh, things as simple as where a patient is. So we have through my building. I probably have about 500 patients go through my building every day. All right, I got to know where they are, where they're moving to when they get a test, where they come back. We don't know where a patient goes. If they're on the fourth floor and need to go get an x-ray, how do we know who's going to get them, when they're going to get them, how they're going to take them to the x-ray, how are we going to get them back? We have this thing, you know, when, when everybody comes into the hospital and gets admitted, we ask every patient their wishes if something should happen. So if your heart should stop, you want us to bring you back to life, right? A lot of 90-year-olds, 80-year-olds don't want to be resuscitated, right? And so every patient is one of the regulations we have. We have to ask, we have a form, it's in the computer, all right? Uh, now, here we are, we have 200 patients in the hospital. We have no idea those things right now. And so, so, so that's one. We didn't know where patients were, how to give medications. We knew how to get the medications out, how do we track where the, who's given the medications? And a whole host of things, labs. Every patient has 10, 10 things in labs. You have to handwrite their names and their medical record numbers. So you can just see the fraught, how, how risky it is. How so you can do the, give the wrong the, the patient, the medication to the wrong patient, or do the wrong test, or so really a lot of safety issues. And what was very clear to us very early was we have downtime, we all have downtime processes, meaning Computers are gonna go down, and you're gonna have backups. All our processes were for like four hours, or 10 hours, or 12 hours, not for 10 days. Right? So everything was for short, and we practice our downtime processes, so we were good, but we also usually don't have everything go down. Right? We have this go down, we're on a downtime process. We have that go down, we're on a downtime process. We don't have everything go down. So what that was pro so that's why it was so challenging. So what we did, and you know, what I'm going to do is kind of reflect on a couple of principles, and I'll share some of the stories as we go through. But we we quickly got everybody together, and it was it was old school. I mean, we didn't have we had we had who's going to take notes, who's going to communicate to who, uh, who's who's responsible to know where the patients are. We were we were really going back, and and what's interesting is most physicians that were trained. After 2002, three, they don't know how to do anything on paper. <laughs> Most nurses that have been trained after 2002 have no idea how to do anything on paper. So all of that stuff it became a real reality. So what we what did we do? We quickly got a couple of older, uh, I'd say, experienced physicians <laughs> and experienced nurses, and we helped them. They they actually went and quickly put together. This is what you do, and then we went unit to unit and made sure that people knew how to do things quickly. Seven to 10 days, clearly, I gotta tell you, I've been through a lot in healthcare, worst seven to 10 days of my professional career. Um, and the biggest thing was we didn't wanna hurt anybody, right? So we didn't wanna, we didn't wanna do something wrong. We were fortunate, we were able, we didn't have any errors, we didn't hurt anybody, we continued operations, all right? So the next is the COVID surge two that I talked about in the field hospital. And the field hospital, um, you know, when we, when we, we talked about this, we had to put this together, and if some of you know that know Cranston, it's on Sakanasset across from Whole Foods. That's where Top Golf is now. Um, and so my son used to always say, Dad, <laughs> Top Golf isn't going up because this thing's still up. <laughs> so, like, because they, they, they postponed Top Golf's construction because of this. 
So we went in and we looked, this is what the, it was an old, it was Cranston, I mean, Citizens Bank's uh, headquarters. They moved to, I think, Smithfield. Uh, and um, so this is what it was. We went in about a month or two before this when we started seeing this uh, spike go up. This is what it looked like. You, you know, the conjunction with the state, uh, Rhode Island National Guard and a whole host of others. Um, we constructed it. Um, this, we ended up with a field hospital on uh, Kent's license. So the thing about regulations is everything in that building had to comply with everything in a hospital. Right? That's a, so if you do anything on a hospital license, you have to, you have to make sure everything is the same. So, but we did plant a flag. Um, we did, if you look here, these big units, um, kind of here, here, what we, what, what we had to create was a, a negative pressure situation in a, rock, a large building, right? The negative pressure situation is basically uh, the pressure is lower inside the space where we're taking care of the patients compared to outside. Meaning, if I open the door, so if it's negative pressure in that, bit, in that room and I open the door, air is not going to come this way. So infection is not going to come this way. So we had to do that process there. So those big units were put up uh, to do those kind of things. We had to bring oxygen tanks, big oxygen tanks, which, uh, and, and other logistics like that. So then converted into this about 350 beds because we didn't know exactly what to expect. If you can do it, do it right the first time. And uh, we had this kind of uh, done. We tried to get creative. Each of the each of the hallways had a beach name from Rhode Island, and so we we had a good process. Set up. And we ran it for about four months. Um, so some of our nursing staff. Um, this is we call this the, the honeymoon suite. Uh, this husband and wife um, got to get right next to each other and get to finish out their COVID treatment at, at this place. If they were in a hospital, they'd be in their private rooms. They wouldn't get to see each other at all. Um, it was a little bit more liberating because we had such a large space that was negative pressure. Whereas in our hospital, they were all small rooms, individual rooms. So the patient could never leave that room because every, nothing else was negative pressure. We had patients that got to recover because they get to walk around because the whole space is negative pressure. Um, this would never happen in our, would have never happened in the hospital. And so what was happening, as, as I was mentioning, was um, patients were staying longer in the hospital because they were getting sicker and they were debilitated and they're old and they weren't recovering as fast because we couldn't actually get them out of bed and move them around except in their room. And so this allowed them to recover a little bit faster. Um, we even had like TV rooms and we had arts show. I mean, we we try, really try to get them uh, moving and around. And just like any hospital, um, we have a uh, you know, coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> this is our uh, uh, VP of operations. She, every, every checklist always had coffee, coffee, coffee. So we named a little section after her. And, and uh, what this did for us though, is we were able to care for about 40% of the patients that came to Kent Hospital during that time with COVID at the second part of their, of, their, um, of their hospitalization. So they came in, we'd stabilize them, they'd start getting better. Like I said, 10 to 15 days is the length of stay as opposed to five. So around five, day five or six, we would transfer them here, all right? And, then, and their recovery would go a little smoother because we get their, their recovery, so we were able to get them out of bed, we were able to move them, those kind of things. So we were able to continue our normal operations at the hospital without having to compromise on, on surgeries and other things. And you know, from a business perspective, it's really, really important um, because um, if a patient stays in a hospital, uh, how we get reimbursed for the most part, if a patient stays in the hospital for four days, I get an amount, all right? Let's, let's say that's $15,000. If they stay for five, five days, I get $15,000. If they stay for 15 days, I get $15,000. If they stay for 25 days, I get $15,000. So, but my cost every day is the same, all right? So, so my ability to run a business, is, it's compromised if I don't, if I don't have an efficient um, th throughput. So, so it's something that really, um, you know, and so both of those have really, as I th thought about those things, um, they did, they have helped me uh, become a better leader and, and think through different things. So when I ran the field hospital, I was the chief medical officer at the at, at our hospital. Um, now I'm the president and COO. Um, I, a lot of the people that help me in some of these crises are in big leadership roles as well because it makes you really um, learn who you are as a leader and learn to trust your instincts. So as I was putting this together, again, I'm not a crisis management expert in any way, all right? Um, so I, I was like, all right, let's look about, think about crisis, right? So I, crisis at the border, financial crisis, opioid crisis, COVID-19 crisis, kids in crisis, Wall Street crisis, energy crisis. 
Uh, even, even the royal family is in crisis. Everybody's in crisis, all right? So I was like, what is crisis, really? Like, you know, so I was thinking about this. And, and uh, everybody's got a little bit of a different definition, right? CDC says an acute emotional upset is manifest in an inability to cope emotionally, cognitively, or behaviorally and solve problems as usual. Uh, the Webster Dictionary says a moment of risk or stress. Cambridge Dictionary says a time of great disagreement, confusion. And what it was clear is every definition, there's not really a very clear definition. And there's a lot of emotion associated with it. And it's pretty vague as far as what, who gets to call something a crisis, right? I, and, and so, so I really was like trying to figure out what I wanted to share with you guys from those two experiences. And I kind of came up with eight, eight principles that I learned um, that I think uh, I find valuable and I still find valuable every day from an operational perspective. So we're gonna talk about the psychology of a crisis. We're talking about uncertainty, communication, uh, what I call the Mike Tyson principle, speed over precision, share power and delegate, adapt and innovate and engage. And, and those, uh, you know, I, I, as I thought about what I did during that time, um, these are a lot of the principles I use in the day to day. So when we talk about leadership, it's day to day fires, right? It's day to day issues that you have to problem solve while you're thinking about the long term, all right? And, and if you just focus on your day to day fires, you're not going to succeed long term. So you've got to do both. And this is a, this is a skill you've got to have to learn. And, and, um, and part of it is as you do more of it, you trust yourself more and more of, of what you do. So psychology of a crisis. So people may experience a wide range of emotions. Um, people have fear and anxiety. Um, they, they, you know, uh, in our job when they have fear and anxiety isn't to tell them everything's gonna be okay, all right? It's to acknowledge some of that. There's gonna be hopelessness and helplessness and there's gonna be feeling like nothing's gonna be done, nothing can be done and there's a lot of denial that this isn't happening. So as a leader, what I've learned is when things are going bad, uh, my job isn't to say it's gonna be okay. My job is not to, to, to dismiss the feelings, the feelings are real, is to acknowledge it and see, uh, to be able to share what we're gonna do about it and try to, uh, you know, action in, in the psychology, you know, action during this period really helps quite a bit. So this picture here is um, a picture of somebody, when, when we put somebody on a ventilator, right? Uh, what happens is you open their mouth, you put a tube in, a lot of stuff comes out, right? And around the world, what was happening during the COVID crisis was where healthcare workers were getting sick while doing this. Because the risk is high, right? Even when you're protected. And so there was a lot, um, and, and more people were putting people on ventilators early. And people that don't intubate very often, right? So meaning, um, so I'm an internist. I, when I was practicing quite a bit, I would intubate somebody maybe once a month, right? Um, twice a month. I can do it, but boy, I better do it right. I mean, I can get it, but, it, but it could be a little messy, meaning a lot of, I could get sick. And so there was a lot of fear from our clinicians because of that, all right? Because more people were going on ventilators. And this is a, this is a picture of how many of the air particles kind of hit, <laughs> even when you're protected. And so we wanted to kind of address that. And so quickly what we did was I said, all right, well, we, let's take some action here. Let's kind of figure, we understand everybody's scared about this. So who are the clinicians and the doctors that do this the most? It's our anesthesiologist. They do it about 30 times a day. At our hospital, they do about 40 times a day. We do about 40 surgeries a day. So we got our anesthesiology department, and that's our chief of anesthesia, <laughs> and we created this kind of a intubation SWAT team. All right, and, and, um, and so basically they had a kit, and anytime somebody needed it, this, this is the person that would go and do it. They do it so well, they're so good at it, they're in and out really quickly. So that brought the rest of the clinician's anxiety down, all right? The other is we created, we tried to say, okay, there's spores coming everywhere, what can we do? So we quickly worked with some plastics companies locally and kind of built uh, things so when they're doing it, it would at least hit that. We thought it was brilliant, didn't really help. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you gotta try, right? But it made everybody in the hospital, in the field hospital feel a lot safer. All right, and that's important. The other uh, sec principle two is uncertainty. Get used to it, all right? Actually, you need to get used to it as a leader. It's every day, nothing about crisis. You gotta understand you're making decisions with not all the information. This is a really um, impactful uh, slide for me. On the um, x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, you have demand, all right? So the, the blue dotted line is the amount, the demand for people wanting more information. 
like your team, your, your staff, how much information they want, right? You see how high it is early. And you as a leader, the availability of information is the lowest, right? So there's a period of time in, in any crisis or any problem that people want more than you have actual information to give, all right? Then real information to give. So that zone of, is, you know, is, is the greatest time of uncertainty, that people want information, you wish you had it, you don't have it, right? And that's where you have to make most of the impactful decisions, right? So what do you do? You gotta just get used to it. If you dwell on it, you think you need to get everything, you know, buttoned down, you're never gonna make a decision and you're gonna cause more problems. Learn to trust your instincts, and you'll hear me say that a lot because as a leader I've learned that I, I need to do that more. Um, and, and so this is one of the most important things in my it, crisis, day-to-day -day problems, you're gonna make decisions based on a risk ass adjust assessment that you're gonna have to figure out. So, so that's principle number two for me. Principle number three is communication. Um, it is the most important thing in leadership and more important in crisis, all right? The, com uh, you know, communication to me is, uh, if you learn anything from your MBA, learn how to communicate with your teams. Uh, because uh, in, in, in one size doesn't fit communication for anybody, all right? You send an email, it's just that, all right? One, people that read it have the information, they might interpret it differently. And it's your, my, my impression as I've gone through leadership, it's my responsibility as a leader to make sure the people I'm trying to communicate understand what I wanna say. It's not their responsibility to understand what I wanna say. So that's, that's a paradigm shift that I think through, through crisis, you gotta really think about that. Really set some expectations, give some standard follow, you know, you gotta give some um, structure to how you're gonna do communicate. And I, I thought, especially during the pandemic and the field hospital, I thought about internal communication a lot, and I thought about external communication a lot. And internal communication was my team, the people working in the field hospital, the hospital, the state officials, the Rhode Island National Guard, all those folks, that's what I called in, uh, internal communication. I wanted to have a plan that was you know, consistent, timely, predictable, that they knew they could, there was a process in which information was coming and a way for them to uh, respond back to me. Um, and, and the more you do that, the less anxiety there is because they, everybody knows there's a time that's coming. And then, so the only things that need to be raised quickly will be raised if there's a predictability about your internal communication. External communication, and particularly in the field hospital, and through the cyber attack was challenging because now we're talking about the community, right? Hysteria in the community does not help a health system, all right? If somebody was having a heart attack across the street from my hospital and they didn't feel safe to come to my hospital, that's a problem. And so, so externally, we had to be very you know, clear in what we're trying to do. So we, you know, during the cyber attack, same thing. We're, we're yes, but everybody's safe. This is what we're doing, no, no issues. You should still, and through the field hospital, we, we were doing a lot of news media because of that. We wanted to make sure that people didn't feel like it was, it was the pictures that were coming out of Italy early in COVID, all right? We wanted to make sure people knew we got this, all right? And we would just, you gotta be confident because if, if they're not, then it's gonna cause more problems. You know, Rudy Giuliani had this quote, and I love it, which is, promise only when you're positive. Promise only when you're positive, all right? This rule sounds so obvious, but I, I gotta, and he says that this sounds obvious, that I wouldn't mention it unless I saw leaders break it all the time. I see people break it all the time, right? When, when you know, things are the worst, don't overpromise. Don't say things are gonna be okay. Acknowledge the situation, right? So that's principle three for me. Uh, so this is communication-wise, this is some of the things we did. We, that's a picture of the Rhode Island National Guard, a few of our staff, and every day we had a clear cadence, which as I was talking about, at 7 a.m. every morning, I would do a call with all the leaders in our health system, right? At 7 a.m., there'd be about 30 leaders, and I would say, here's what's happening with COVID at the, at the Kent Hospital site. Here's what's happening at the field hospital site. Here are the situations. At 7.30, I would communicate that very thing to about 30 physician leaders in our organization, so they, via text, and a text chain, because uh, doctors don't read emails. <laughs> uh, so we text everybody. All right, at 7.30 every day for really most of pandemic, these two things were happening from March of 2020 till April of 2021, seven days a week, 
All right, we were doing this. Um, when I say we, I mean me. <laughs> um, at nine o'clock, we brought the field hospital staff together, the leaders in the field hospital, and we did a, we did a huddle. This was our huddle board. And we had very consistent themes of what we're gonna do. We had a checklist of the things each department would have to say uh, and go through, and then we would pivot and, and, and do what we needed to. And at the end of the day, I had the call with those 30 physician leaders to say, how's the day, what's going? Because what was happening was physicians get sick too, families get sick. What are we gonna do in those situations? So we really wanted to stay connected during that time. And these are the checkpoints that early we would get a lot of phone calls, a lot of hysteria as we set these things up. It became predictable for everybody of how we're gonna do things. And it's the only things that got raised in the middle needed to be raised. So then principle four, my favorite, um, is the Tyson principle, all right? As a leader, everyone has a plan. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face and there's then you gotta pivot, all right? And, and I could tell you, uh, you know, this was, uh, so preparing to start our field hospital, we met daily, I mean, I had, you know, probably about 20 leaders meeting daily on logistics. Who's gonna feed who? Who's gonna clean? Who's gonna do this? We had all these companies we're going through this checklist. My human resources team had uh, been working on the staffing. We had to get contingency staffing, crisis staffing from out of state. You know, there's companies that do crisis staffing. Um, and so we're going through these checklists daily, all right? We tell the state, we tell the governor that we're gonna start admitting patients the Monday after Thanksgiving, all right? We're ready, so Friday after Thanksgiving, on the five o'clock call, with, I was doing two, two, day, two twice a day calls to get ready for this to go live. Friday afternoon, the company that had uh, given us staff pulled out, which basically means it happened a lot in COVID. They got a better deal somewhere else. So the Friday before we're supposed to take patients, I had no nursing staff, all right? So, um, so uh, everybody knows this is what we're doing. So this is the thing around you know, making sure the community understands that we've, 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 gotta be, we've gotta be confident. We gotta make sure we're consistent. We can't cause any more you know, hysteria. And I can't um, you know, fail my boss. My boss has told everybody we're taking patients one day. Right? So the CEO of our system. It would not look good if we said we've been planning towards this, so then I had to assess, right? So um, by Saturday, we, I'd found another company. It would take about a week to get them to bring staff. Um, so I had a week that I had to do something. And so I'm a doctor. There's three other doctors there. There's three other nurse leaders there that we're, we're setting this up. So I said, I was like, you know what? I didn't say we're going to take 30 patients one day. I said, we're gonna take a patient one day. So we took a patient, we took another one the next day. We, the six of us stayed there for a week and we took care of about five patients and made sure our kinks were worked out. And by Friday, we had staff and we started able to ramp up. But, but, I'm, but my point is, every crisis you go through, you can plan for all you want to, something's gonna be different. And you gotta be ready to kind of understand that you gotta make some changes. <clears throat> Principle five, speed over precision. You guys are MBA students. I hear you're four plus one. So pretty ambitious MBA students. You know, you guys are go-getters. Um, you wanna make sure you make the right decision. You don't have time. Speed, some, you gotta decide, you gotta make that balance. Speed is sometimes better than being exactly right. All right, so you gotta assess that. Define your priorities, ensure your leadership is aligned with that. You, um, you know, understand you're gonna make some trade-offs, right? And, and I, I tell you, during the cyber attack, so the morning of that it happened, uh, everybody was freaked out because we didn't know exactly what we were going to do, and and so quick, it's quickly we you know we got our leaders in a room, and and said basically we got three different leaders with three whiteboards, and we said all right, all we're going to talk about for the next thirty minutes are the dangers that we're worried about that we can't commit this, and then we quickly as quick as we could we wrote them down, and then we quickly circled about four things and said, let's get this solved by noon. All right, and that's, so we, we and, and, and then what we decided, half of it we didn't use two days later. But we wanted to make sure, we wanted to make sure we knew where patients were, we wanted to make sure patients didn't get the wrong medication, and we wanted to make sure that if some, something should happen to somebody that we you know, knew their wishes. Those were three things that were really important to us, and so we wanted to make sure that that got done right away. All right, uh, and, and, when you make quick decisions, you're gonna make wrong decisions, all right? So recognize when you make wrong decisions, don't stick to your guns, change. Like, 
May be very adaptable to that fact. Understand your feedback loops and change. So make decisions quick, but be prepared to, to pivot. All right, principle six, um, share the power and delegate. Um, again, as you know, uh, ambitious four plus one MBA students, you could probably do this as well as ever, everything. You're gonna wanna control, all right? You, you can't control everything. The, the further you get along in your leadership career, the less ability you have to do that. You have to trust people. Right? So that's why when you hear, put people you trust in place, that's why. Because you, there's not minutes in the day for you to do everything. All right? And you lose that pretty quickly if you're going down a leadership. So you know, when I was, prior to my chief medical officer role, um, I, I ran a hospitalist group. I had 150 physicians. I didn't see half of them most of the time. Right? So I don't, you can't, so you know, when you grow through leadership, you go through with relationships. As you get more and more people under you, those relationships go away because you don't know them. And so you really have to understand who you put in leadership and delegate. So this was my team at the field hospital. A um, couple of doctors and a couple of nurses. And, I, and what I want to say about that is, and, and most of them are in different leadership roles now. A lot of them weren't leaders when we put them here. Right? So I have one of my ACNOs, assistant nurse, um, uh, one of our VPs uh, of nursing is, is on here. Um, our new ED chief is on here. So people, you, you learn about people and their leadership skills through crisis, and so look at that. But when I put this team together, I thought about who I wanted to bring, right? I didn't go to every chief and say, hey, come join me. I went and I picked a very diverse, strategic, what I needed from everybody, all right? So my nurses, I had two nurse leaders there. One was a OR nurse leader, right? Very much a go-getter. Problem solved, problem solved, problem solved, all right? The other one was a deep thinker about policy and procedure. So we're in a bank building trying to do healthcare safely. I needed somebody to move quickly, but I needed somebody to stay safe also. So putting the two of them together, they fought a little bit, but people were safer because of that, all right? Same thing with the physicians. We picked physicians that way as well. Um, delegate authority, you can't control everything. You gotta trust your people that you put in place. And then um, and create a culture that it's, you know, and try to lead by example. It's okay to make mistakes, communicate, and, and, and delegate authority. So that's principle six for me that I learned. Principle seven is adapt and innovate. Innovate, innovate, innovate. And innovate doesn't mean you're doing the most cutting edge thing. Innovate means do things differently than you usually do. All right? And, and for us in the, in, the, in, the, in the cyber attack space, um, I'll give you two examples that I have up here just for my reminder. Um, one is, you see these x-ray boxes. So, so all of a sudden, so right now in my hospital, you can go to any terminal in any, any floor, or I can do it at my laptop, pull up the EMR, go to your, your file, pull up your x-ray that was done about 30 minutes ago, or your CAT scan. And I can look at it, I can see what the radiologist thought at any place, all right? We've all gotten accustomed to that. When I was a resident, which was 25 years ago, well, that wasn't the case. You couldn't fill it up on it every, every place. You had to go to the radiology department, which was usually on the first, or basement, first floor of the basement. You had to get the file room to get you this big stack with about 20 x-rays in it. You had to go to a wall that had a light box. That's what that is. You had to put it up, and then you had to look at it. All right. Well, here we are. We don't have x-rays. We don't know what to do you know, in this situation. So we decide, all right, that makes sense. Let's just start printing them. We can print them still. So we start printing them. So it was the first hour we print them, and everybody's like, we don't have light boxes. We took all the light boxes off of the, in, the, in the entire hospital because we don't need it. And so then we had to kind of say, what do we do now? And so we then were able to get a single connection to each of our di uh, diagnostic imaging, and it was, a, it, was a, it was literally a monitor, and the radiologist would sit there and read it, and the radiologist would have to sit there and read it, and you'd have to go down and talk to the radiologist to do it. So we had to, we had to make some changes. The medication list here, um, we had to create it again because what we had was for the day and we needed something for seven days and we had to have nurses create this for us and then teach the other nurses and the pharmacists how to do it. So we just had, and there's example after example of those kind of things that we had to do for both the cyber attack and the field hospital. Like in the field hospital, for example, we had planned, so that big building that I showed you, um, there's, there's actually only one on and off switch for lights. <laughs> So at nighttime, if we turned it off, like the entire hospital was dark. So we didn't know that until after the first patient 
<laughs> because we didn't have to, well, when we left every day when we were planning, we turned the lights off. <laughs> we didn't think about, you know, so you're gonna have to understand that you can plan all you want, but you're gonna make some mistakes and you gotta learn and pivot from them. Um, all right, la uh, last, so engage. engage. Um, through a crisis, you know, you gotta, you have to connect with whoever you're trying to lead. Um, you gotta content connect with the individual team members. You gotta see how they're doing and how they're feeling. Um, you gotta, and don't minimize that. So if somebody is anxious, it's, it's okay. Like, don't minimize their feelings. Engage them, ask for a lot of help, and, and, and I'm all, during this, um, the most um, stressful times, that's when you wanna appear the calmest, all right, that's why you want to encourage, don't overpromise, but always, always make people feel engaged. This is an example of, for our patients. We had, some, you know, the staff wanted to do something and they were, so we, we put some of our, I would say, more anxious staff at the hospital on a mission to create a card program with schools. All right, so that's what they spent their energy, instead of on worried about how we're gonna do this, they spent their energy on connecting with local schools to give, have them make cards. That it was great for the patient, it, it was a nice thing to do, but it really gave some tasks to people that needed, that were having some struggles. And then we did, you know, these kind of things where we had a big banner up and anyone that worked at this field hospital got, were signing in. Within two weeks we had it completely, um, so it's in my office now, we haven't put it up yet, but it, there's not actually one white space on it. And, and so we'll at some point come back and, you know, do that. So those are some of the eight principles that I kind of learned during my crisis. Again, I'm not a crisis management expert in any way, um, but, but I think I, I learned a lot as a leader and about myself as I went through this. Happy to take any questions. So like in a post-COVID environment, in the healthcare industry, do you see that a lot of these processes have still been affecting your day-to-day -day operations, or maybe contributing to like contri continuous improvements, something like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we do differently. No question, our our safety pr protocols are different, particularly for COVID. Um, and so, what that did was, um, you know, um, we're like any other factory in the sense that like they're people, but how we care for them and how long they stay in each section is really important, right? And so when you do safety protocols around COVID, around infection prevention protocols, they haven't changed. Now, during COVID, they changed quite a bit. And, and so we still have to put that in. And so it has caused our, our ability to do things smoother, more challenging, right? And so we, we've had to really understand, I've, we've gotten more precise on understanding each of those things and we did before COVID. So I know my pressure points a lot more than I did prior to COVID. Thanks gotcha. for this. Thank you. Yeah. So did, <coughs> did you pay the ransom or did you recover from scratch? Uh, I, I'm not allowed to say anything about that. Okay. But uh, yeah. let's say it could, it could have been three months, it was 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> when you gave me that time frame, I was, mm. Mm. <laughs> When you um, were supposed to open up that yeah, day, yeah. and you brought your employees together and, and went that full week, did the media find out, or did you come up that screen? Good job. <laughs> well done. <laughs> we're working through the logistics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how did these crises, crises influence your onboarding process for new employees? Yeah. Um, our onboarding process um, it, during the crisis period, um, you know, uh, in healthcare in particular, everybody's like, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, and it's gonna take, you know, two months to get somebody in. And we, we, we certainly said this is a crisis situation and we would we, uh, not cut corners, but we would put some emphasis to improve it. So for physicians, for example, is a good example. Um, if you're a physician and you wanna come practice at my hospital and you, you apply for it today, I couldn't realistically get you on for about three months because I'm obligated for my licensure and something called a joint commission that oversees our, our hospital that I gotta do a background check on you. I gotta do what we call a national practitioner data bank check on you, which is to make sure you've had no lawsuits in the past. I gotta make sure that I get three references from you, from, from people that, um, that you've worked with in healthcare. I have to make sure that you've done what you say you did. I gotta make sure that um, you went to undergrad where you said you did, where you went to med school where you said you did, 
where you know all those things and and you know all those things have to come together and then I have a, a credentialing committee that looks at all those things and says, is this doctor safe to practice at our hospital? All right, all that takes about three months and I can't wait three months for some of this stuff. And so we, what we had to do was get some, um, within our bylaws, we have waste emergency situations, how we do those things, but it has impacted our, our, our ability to onboard people quickly. The other thing it's really done, to be honest with you, and I think that's more just society related, people will take a job with us and may not show up, <laughs> even though like, you know, that happens, uh, you, you would think that would only happen in, in you know, lower paying jobs, it happens in everything. It didn't before. Or people will, a nurse or a doctor, not, doesn't happen often, but once they start, usually wouldn't just not come back. <laughs> That's happened in healthcare in the last couple of years. Other questions, yeah? I had a question yeah. about like, you know, this was a, obviously a huge crisis, a lot of anxiety. Um, it also impacted a lot of healthcare workers and like serious mental health, mm. you know, to watch not only COVID patients get better, but not get better and like, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, die in isolation and all of those kinds of things. Did you see, you know, that really impacting your entire team and how would you kind of help them to get, you know, get out of really kind of bad places because, and they were obviously overworked, yeah. you know, all of those kinds of so, you know, the fortunate is by the time we brought people to this field hospital, we were very um, clear on patient selection because there's only so much we could do, right? right? So, so we did, out of all the patients we took care of, only one we had to send back to the hospital, the, the, the main hospital. But, but what we saw through the pandemic was a couple of things, and, and we struggled with it. There's a lot of burnout. People quit, people cut back, people still do, people haven't come back. And, and you know, we, we would do things, you know, uh, a lot of things in the pandemic um, weren't really about science. Um, and, and I think we've kind of seen that uh, unfold as the time has come by. The, the CDC's recommendations weren't completely like factual. Like there's a lot of nuances, right? So vaccine was another one. It was all about your political stance. And, and, and um, it's not my place to tell you what your political stance is, but people would come in and it would be heartbreaking to my ICU staff on older patients that should have gotten vaccinated and then they didn't and now they're, at the, they're really sick and they're like, can, can you vaccinate me? And it doesn't help at this point, and like that kind of stuff. So that really, that, that was actually what, about what our ICU staff struggled the most with. Um, and then and a lot of, you know, we didn't have enough staff. And so, so, you know, and when you look at our healthcare workforce, there's a large portion of nurses that are 58 to 65, right? As this went, they're like, you know what? I don't need to work anymore. And they cut back because it's, you know, they'd rather be with their families or, and now you've got this large portion of your workforce that you don't have. And then you have um, you know, younger nurses uh, and, and staff that haven't experienced a lot of this stuff. So they've struggled. So, so burnout is a real thing for us. That, to me, that's probably my single biggest issue is uh, workforce and, 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 and burnout. Um, you talked about with the field hospital that you guys had it for about, what was it, a four month period? Right? Yeah, we had it open for about four month period. Okay. Um, question for you there, was that like logistically and financially, did that pan out as a benefit for you guys? I know with you saying obviously the patients are there for a longer period, which is a harder thing for you guys as a business to deal with, um, plus the decrease in healthcare workers. Yeah. How much of a struggle actually was that for you guys to do? It was, it, uh, so, you know, 20, 2020 and 2021 was probably some of the worst years in healthcare finance, if you look. The thing, but um, there was a lot of dollars that came from the federal government. Right, all over the place. So, so to me, so we were able to get through because of that. Because if you think about how a hospital makes money, and I, you know, I gave you an example of length of stay before, for four days to 15 days. We don't make money on patients getting admitted to the hospital. We, get, we make money on um, patients getting the voluntary surgery. We make money on outpatient testing, all that kind of stuff, all right? And so those go away in COVID, so we struggled with that. But the worst financial year in healthcare wasn't any of these things, it was the year after, all right? The year after, there was no money coming from the federal government. We had the same workforce challenges. We had, uh, you know, uh, premium pay was through the roof. Um, so we struggled. So in, in fiscal 22, in 20, um, over, I think, 50% of the health systems in the country had a negative margin. Um, 
Um, and, and, and that's tough when, you know, uh, that's a, so we, we put, and we're, everybody's slowly starting to recover. So like for my health care system, for the last 12 months, we've been in the black. Um, the prior 24 months, we were not. So just a comment, uh, because when you were looking up crisis, mm -hmm. you did the academic approach mm -hmm. of looking at the dictionaries. Mm -hmm. uh, globally, we have two certification mm -hmm. bodies, DRII, Disaster Recovery Institute International, and out of UK, the BCI, Business Continuity Institute. Mm -hmm. They provide certifications mm -hmm. in this space. Yeah. And you know what, what you did on your own, Many people, as you, as you said up front, you know, I'm not a crisis manager, I'm yeah. not a professional, but you know, people study this and mm -hmm. you successfully, you know, sort of learned as you <laughs> went. Exactly. Great job. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my group and I are going to present our presentation on motor dynamics. Uh, before I get into a quick background on the company, I just want to explain a little bit of what we did over in Greece. So we were presented with the opportunity to go over there, and we attended Alba Business School, graduate school I should say, in Athens, uh, where we attended lectures daily, where we gained knowledge on crisis management as well as other topics. I'm Ari. I'm Eddie. I'm Isabella. I'm Orlando. I'm Nathan. I'm Kevin. <laughs> All right, so just a brief company background. So Motor Dynamics was established in 1969. They are a distributor of, distributor of automotive products. This includes vehicles as well as car parts. Um, their um, overseas actions began in the 90s. And if we take a quick look at this map, you can see um, where their locations vary. Uh, Greece is where they're specifically located and then other Balkan countries around them. Um, their main divisions include Porsche, Sixth, and Yamaha, and that's where these locations also represent. Um, this uh, structure um, that they have is um, completed with support divisions of finance, IT, and human resources, and they have a team of about 350 employees. So building off of that, uh, Motor Dynamics, like Orlando said, is broken up into three different divisions. Uh, we made this diagram kind of give you just a visual to see uh, what markets they're in, uh, if you're not familiar with them. The left side is Yamaha. They deal with motorcycles and scooters. Uh, the middle, Porsche, uh, cars, and then sixth is a rental. And then different mar market participants below each division, so Honda and Suzuki and the motorcycles, Audi, Mercedes-Benz, BMW. And six Hertz Davis Enterprise. I'm sure you guys have seen them. Uh, so this was just kind of a background for you guys. And before we go into how Moto Dynamics handled the crisis, we're going to talk about the crisis in the whole a little bit. Just give a little background. So the Greek financial crisis started kind of as an indirect result of the U.S. financial crisis. Greece is a culture that relies heavily on tourism and exports. And when the worldwide crisis hit, people had a lot less discretionary income to spend on things like tourism. So Greek took a big hit from this. And the worldwide financial crisis also froze credit markets, which made it more expensive for Greece to borrow money and try and get out of this hole. So Greece had already already had high levels of debt before this. In 2009, Greece's budget deficit was over 15% of its GDP, which was the highest in Europe at the time. And this caused Greece's bond market to collapse. Greece eventually was loaned over 320 billion euros from banks in Germany and France, and they're set to be paying this off until 2060. So, like many companies, uh, Motor Dynamics was significantly affected by the financial crisis. And first uh, division, kind of their overall organizational structure and culture was the first thing that really needed to be reworked. Uh, these were the steps below that they kind of took. And we uh, analyzed all these. First and foremost, they downsized staff and salaries proportionally and reduced sale networks by 30%. And while this was really unfortunate for them, it was needed to cut costs. And then by prioritizing their healthy dealerships and fostering innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, they were able to benefit the company in the long run. And then <clears throat> the goal was to centralize the decision making in their uh, smaller dealerships and help maintain focus on the end customers and be able to reorganize strategically if needed in the drastically changing market. 
So like most companies uh, during the crisis, financial management strategies had to be adjusted. Uh, the big emphasis was on cutting costs and they re regularly re renegotiated credit lines and worked to extend credit policies. Um, they overall just worked to eliminate um, costs that they didn't necessarily need, such as various benefits, as well as reviewing contracts to minimize expenses. In addition to um, financial and organizational strategies, they took efforts to better their pro product and marketing strategies. Um, they shifted focus towards efficient product lines, ones with high future potential, and, and dropped various product lines that weren't doing as well. Um, they switched to a lean uh, inventory management approach and began focusing on exports for products that the Greek market couldn't absorb. So in trying to understand Moto Dynamics better, we thought it would be very beneficial to take a look at one of their competitors that perhaps recovered uh, at a higher rate during the crisis itself. So we took a look at Germany Volkswagen Group. So Germany was a subsidiary of Volkswagen as a larger company. And part of the reason it succeeded financially during the crisis was completely out of the control of Volkswagen. Uh, Porsche had actually been secretly buying shares of stock. And this led to a short squeeze in the stock price but more importantly, what we took a look at and what we thought would be very um, insightful in terms of taking a closer look at Moto Dynamics as well was their diversified positioning around the world. So take for example, they had strong markets in Latin America and China. And they actually had a rather weak position in the United States. So if you imagine um, it as an animal with different legs in different countries, when the United States suffered financially and it got its leg chopped off, um, it was still standing. So this helped uh, Volkswagen to make sure that even though it had a strong presence in the United States, it, it didn't have all its eggs in one basket. And not to mention, as we'll talk about more uh, thoroughly later, it was an implementation of a crisis management team uh, as early as 2015. So Mono Dynamics currently has a relatively informal crisis management protocol in place, which is helpful when a crisis arises, but implementing an internal crisis management team is essential in the overall prevention of financial downturn before a crisis arises. So this team will consist of experts that know how to deal with crises and how to react to them. And the five areas that this team would focus on are risk assessment and planning, so this is the first step where the team kind of identifies potential risks and provides plans to deal with those risks. The second is in, um, crisis communication. This is a vital aspect where stakeholders, employers, and the media are all informed about the crisis through various methods such as email, press releases, and social media. The third is crisis, incident and crisis. Uh, this is the immediate action phase where the team needs to make decisions very quickly and effectively. The fourth area is crisis uh, business continuity. This is to ensure that the company can continue operating during the crisis as well as after through alternative work plans. And then the last area is crisis recovery. And this is a post-action, um, post-crisis action where the team identifies damages to the company as well as implement steps to repair those damages. And then along with the crisis management team, there are team operations. So there's crisis management plan. This is just a list of procedures and protocols for the company. Employee crisis management trainings. This is for all level employees and they would happen quarterly. There's also crisis management simulations. These simulations would represent real life crisis scenarios in a controlled environment where companies can get the opportunity to practice their um, procedures and allows them to have time to make any changes. Uh, there's also cybersecurity trainings and monitor monitoring trends and indicators. So try not to jump out of your seats. We got some research articles that we took a look at. Um, so implementing an organizational strategy and a team dedicated to crisis management is not simple. 
And in fact, we thought it would be beneficial to take a look at some scholarly sources to help show the different dimensions that uh, is involved in creating a crisis management team. Uh, we took a look at a couple different articles, but one quote which stuck out to us um, is, approaches to crisis management strategy consider the internal and external environment. So now what does this remind us all of is a SWOT analysis. So we have to constantly not just be concerned about what's going on outside in the crisis, but how are we dealing with it internally? Um, and this is something that's extremely important with a crisis management team. Obviously, you're working within the organization. Um, and then another quote that I wanted to point out uh, is from an article written in 2019. But the responsibilities, protocols, actions, communications, and more must all be spelled out clearly for the time of crisis. Developing a crisis plan takes time and resources. So not only is uh, a crisis management team something which it can be financially burdensome, but you have to dedicate uh, resources throughout an entire organization to make sure that it's as effective as possible. This is um, something that takes time, a lot of money, um, and a lot of commitment from all employees. So along with short-term opportunities, we looked at some long-term opportunities for Moto Dynamics to move into. The main one being internationalization. And this is essentially when a company spreads out across different countries, that way they're not as subjective to risk from one nation. If, say if Greece were to go into another financial crisis or got involved in a war, Moda Dynamics would take a huge hit because that's where most of the locations are. So we suggested to them that they spread out across uh, more countries. They already have subsidiaries in five other countries but haven't really spread out too much. So we suggested they move into different countries that are different regions. And not only for the internationalization region, but in talking to George Leviditis, who is the director of SIXT, he was our main contact there in Greece. Um, he explained to us how in, with SIX, they see a lot of seasonality. They actually only make profits in the summer. Between October and May, they take losses each month. So we suggested that they move into countries with high winter tourism rates, such as uh, Northern European countries where people go to visit and go skiing in the winter. And we also suggested they move into Egypt. Egypt is such a hot country that their peak uh, tourism season is in the winter. So if they were to move the, expand the six division into these other countries with high winter tourism rates, it would help the losses they incur during the winter, as well as the internationalization in case a national crisis were to occur. Now, it's, it's also important to remember, um, this, this is what we wanted to talk to our contact about uh, most during our uh, final presentation. But, at the same time, while it's important to look at uh, crises from a global scale, we wanted to provide George, our contact at Sixth, um, with some recommendations based on insights from the United States in specific. So dealers and uh, are also facing threats from players such as Carbon and Fair. Now these are newer platforms which are actually steering customers away from brick and mortar dealerships. This could be uh, considered a threat to a company like Moto Dynamics where dealerships are very important. Um, at the same time, if you keep in mind the fact that there are these platforms, that's already giving you um, an advantage. These might not be as relevant in Greece today, but we felt like by recommending this to Moto Dynamics, they would be more aware for it in the future. Um, however, at the same time, we took a look at McKinsey and Company, which argue that there are four key elements to creating organizational resiliency during any crisis. Now, keeping these in mind for your organization, your crisis management team can be extremely beneficial. Uh, McKinsey and Company identify them as agility, empowered teams, adaptable leaders, and talent and culture. Now, uh, making sure you're incorporating this not just in your crisis man management team, but in your entire organization can help to make you uh, much stronger, much more resilient during times of financial or national recession. So thank you very much for your time. Everyone, we wanted to start off by saying thank you for joining us today. We all had the amazing opportunity to travel to Athens, Greece to consult a highly successful financial technology company called Qualco. And during our time, we conducted a cybersecurity analysis and we are here today to present with you our findings. My name is Christine Chassie. I'm Brandon Sarenton. I'm Noah. I'm Kiana. I'm Roman. And I'm Chris. So who is Qualco Group? 
In the words of Qualco, we offer holistic, end-to-end, -end, innovative, tech-enabled solutions and services for the financial well-being of our economy, businesses, communities, and individuals. And throughout this presentation, our objective has been to um, identify opportunities to prevent cybersecurity attacks within Qualco and their clients. So a little bit of the quantum data. Qualco has about a thousand employees right now, 400 of which are remote, which is especially really important when you think about cybersecurity. Having remote workers can be kind of a threat. Uh, about 1,300 hours of training that they have done. So there's a lot of training going on. We'll get a little bit more of that later. Um, as for their assets right now, they have about 35 billion in assets that they're managing. So there is a lot of value that they have to protect there. Uh, some of their largest clients are going to be. Target, um, Intrum, Cabot, not the cheese, if I answer that, but. <laughs> yeah, now just uh, another brief overview of Qualco services. Qualco Group is made up of many different subsidiary companies that adapt their technology solutions to many different industries, such as credit management, digital transformation, real estate asset management and applied intelligence. And this picture document on the left here just shows how they really just offer technology solutions, but it's accessible across many different areas and industries. Cybersecurity, what is it? So to really begin to show the importance of why it's important to have like data security and understand its impacts on an organization, we first took a look at the cyber attacks that have occurred domestically within the United States from 2009 to 2019. And as you can see, these are reported of $1 million plus of reported losses each year. And back in 2018 and 19, there was 104 in 105 different instances of this. So here we have some more cybersecurity statistics that are really notable and just show how frequent it is in today's society. There are 2,200 cyber attacks that happen per day. A cyber attack happens every 39 seconds on average. And in 2020, cybersecurity attacks increased by 358% compared to the previous year in 2019 and has been on track to increase every year since. And cybercrime is predicted to cost the world 9.5 trillion US dollars in 2024. So this just shows that it is really crucial to have a cybersecurity plan in place because of how frequent it happens. And we know many of you are experts in cybersecurity already, but just to give you a brief background, cybersecurity is the utilization of different technologies, laws, rules, and regulations to safeguard any systems, data, and networks from any cyber attacks. So this basically mitigates the likelihood of cyber threats and prevents unauthorized utilization of any sensitive systems. In order to have an effective cybersecurity plan put into place, there does need to be a crisis management plan as well. This is anything that happens from before and after a crisis, so reactive and proactive elements to fix any disruptions and get the company moving smoothly back on track. And adequate measures could expose data to harmful threats, which Chris and Roman will be going to be talking about in later slides as well. Then we also began to take a look at it from a global standpoint. Um, this is a study done by uh, McKinley, and as you can see from 2009 to present, global cybersecurity attacks have happened much more, um, whether it's within emails or um, different financial corporations. There's a lot that can occur when it comes to our data, and since data is becoming more and more like the new oil, it's important that there's plans in place, plan in place in order to protect that assets. Yeah, and here I just want to point out some uh, recent cyber attacks in Greece. Um, these are relevant because these attacks were on Greek public administration. Um, some notable points from these attacks is that it can have, these attacks can involve computers from over 114 different countries. They can attack Greece's critical infrastructure, such as gas, and they can even be politically motivated. So cybersecurity is a very uh, prevalent um, issue in today's society. So when looking at what we should do to approach Qualco's strategy, we want to look at what some other big players in the cybersecurity space were doing, um, and that led us to Intel. So Intel's kind of a global leader right now on the cybersecurity front. They do a lot of work not just for US government, but governments abroad as well. And they have all these amazing processes in place, right? And you can kind of pick and choose what might fit for Qualco from Intel, and maybe impl implement a few of these things into Qualco's current strategy to 
update a little bit. Problem overview. So how does this affect Qualco? So this affects Qualco because they are a fintech service. They have a lot of private data that is vulnerable to cybersecurity threats. These threats are ever changing and there are a lot of detrimental consequences if it's not treated properly, such as financial loss, legal difficulties, losing clients, and a bad reputation. Um, and we think that proper training can make this problem preventable for Qualco and their clients. Research methods. So this is the split framework. This is um, a framework we learned about in our global business class taught by Kate Hall here at the Providence campus. Um, the split framework is used as a guide to better manage global teams, and we thought this would be applicable to Qualco because they are a multinational organization. Um, overall, the split framework helps reduce power distance and increases better cohesion with um, organizational uh, structure and uh, communication. Um, the split framework is made up of five components, structure, process, language, identity, and technology. And we use this framework to help structure our recommendations going forward. Now here are our recommendations that we use using the split framework. So to better understand what we were working with, um, Qualco is a multinational company that is across 35 different, uh, different countries involved with 150 different clients within multiple different industries. And when we sat down with uh, the lead risk manager for Qualco Group, it was clear that she had a lot of um, confidence in her plan and also a lot of background. Like she has 15 years of experience in cybersecurity management. She shared with us her business continuity, their business continuity plan and their disaster policy. And in both of those, pro both of these processes, like they're proactive and there's preparation for continued levels of operation. Um, for if a, if a crisis occurs. We also begin to look at their crisis management plan, which is reactive and more of a response to what's going on, and to get the impact under control. We had the opportunity to sit with one of the leaders from SEV Federation, and when talking to him about Qualco and their crisis management plan, he said that they were actually at the leading edge of uh, creating a plan moving forward, since there hasn't been a lot of policy within the EU around how to handle uh, cybersecurity attacks. And now for the P in the split framework, which stands for process. One thing we notice about Balco is they undergo um, quite a lot of um, employee risk management trainings, and they don't have a key performance indicator for employee risk management comprehension, only the amount of time spent. So as we said before, is around like less than 14,000. Um, and we want to make sure that these employees, when they're doing these programs, are actually understanding and comprehending these programs instead of just doing them as like a corporate burden or task. Um, we recommend maybe just having some simple questions to answer, answer at the end of these um, trainings. And also we began to look at um, like training specific objectives. Uh, considering that crisis can be a lot of stress we talked with Katarina, who was the lead risk manager and some of the other leadership at Qualco about their stress management tools. And it became apparent that there was opportunities for them to share these. So we recommended mindfulness-based stress reduction and also an energy leadership development system, which, better, which helps individuals to better understand how stress influences their day-to-day -day decisions. Um, studies have shown that when you, are, when you are under less stress, you can see more options see more clearly and um, have awareness to what's happening. So the importance of empathy is to better understand that each of us will experience stress differently. And when we understand we each under, when we understand we each experience stress differently, we can take a step back and think a little bit more clearly and empathize with one another on how to move forward. And then we also began to look at the language used within this uh, crisis management plan, uh, considering that they are communicating to 35 different countries. Not every country has the same, uh, the same language. They use English as a means to communicate this across every country, though not every employee knows English. So we began to, we shared that they should use symbols and colors to help highlight how to enact on the crisis management plan. 
and we also encourage them to have protocols in multiple languages that are universal and to symbols to help with the translation. Uh, the ex execution of the plan is the communication across all team members. And example is crisis management team, actually we, we can talk about this one. The crisis management team, we talked about having a more horizontal approach, which yeah. Robin will go into on the next slide. Yeah. So for identity, we found that um, employees within the Qualco kind of had these matching perceptions, and we aim to create an organizational culture that promotes cohesion within the company. Um, we identified that employees were having trouble seeing the difference between audit and risk. Um, old, this is a quote from Olga, a corporate leader there, and she said, it, felt, it feels like the police are coming when they come into your office to perform these risk management trainings. This is not ideal, this is not a company culture we want to promote. So for that we recommend um, internal marketing where you're promoting education and training around these risk management trainings and we want employees to really feel like these trainings are part of their DNA. Um, we want employees to feel excited and proud of these trainings and not have them, again, feel like a burden. Um, we also want to create trust with employees and this can be better done with horizontal communication. Currently, Coco operates from a top-down communication approach where the risk managers um, are communicating with other managers and then, then uh, down to lower level employees where each individual employee has their own protocol. And we feel that would be better with horizontal communication where these risk managers are communicating with every um, level of employee. Um, this can be done just through check-ins and this would help exposure across um, different team members. And overall, this would increase trust and transparency in the organization. All right, so the last aspect of the split framework that we looked at was technology. When analyzing Qualco's crisis management plan, obviously their leader in cybersecurity in Greece already, they have plenty of technology in place already, like um, they have secure VPN connection, they have e phishing emails they regularly send out, their devices auto lock, and they're always em emphasizing you know, using trusted networks and not looking at suspicious links. But as we talked about earlier, 50% of them do the work online and 50% of the work is uh, in office. So we thought maybe focusing more on the remote workers would be beneficial to them since there's a lot more risk to cyber risks when you know, working at home. And we decided that maybe a wired connection from a straight internet modem instead of just using a VPN network would be more secure and more reliable. And then also, uh, we wanted to add a webcam monitor to ensure that no one is in the room or being able to look at the screen because this is financial data that no one is allowed to see. So just even having people walk by or just having people look at the computer is just not allowed and is not acceptable. So having computer camera that would monitor whoever is in the background just could uh, help reduce more risk. And just to conclude, uh, we were able to bring, gain a lot of professional experience working with Qualco in the fintech industry, and also we were able to learn a lot about cybersecurity as well. Uh, not only did we gain all this professional experience, but everybody in Greece also brought back a lot of new cultural experience as well uh, regarding working internationally, so I think that's something that we'll be able to bring back with us. Um, and lastly, you know, cybersecurity is a really important thing, whether it's personally for us, um, the businesses we work at, the organizations that we work for, and the people that we're in charge of protecting. Um, it's kind of all of our responsibilities to make sure that we're accountable and on top of uh, protecting people's data and information in the cybersecurity industry. So I think that concludes what we've got. Closing statements, but thank you all for your time. I did have a comment, and uh, I've taught you anything this year. It is that uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. And I, I just really liked your recommendation on uh, so many companies are just saying, hey, we made our employees watch a cybersecurity video. We're, you know, we're in compliance, we're good. But actually, it, it was such a powerful recommendation to say, make sure you're not just showing them or having gone through, through that, but you're actually testing that, that knowledge. And I think that, that that brings a level of protection that they can provide their clients to just a whole other level. So I thought that was it was really good, really good to see. Um, good morning, everyone. 
Um, our group is a little bit different from the others. We had the privilege of working with GE Healthcare, um, who is an international company who has actually never worked with Roger Williams um, in the past. We were really lucky to give them a good first impression. Um, my name is Haley Carrera. My name is Kelly Moore, if you know. I'm Emma McLean. I'm Emily Newbig. I'm Layla Hubby. All right, and we're just going to get into a brief company background. So GE Healthcare um, is a medical technology organization that spreads across the globe. Um, as you can see here, they have over 50,000 employees spread across over 160 companies. So they are very vastly distributed um, with a lot of their revenues coming from all over the world, but most importantly, um, their biggest revenues in the US and Canada, even though they are um, an organization based in Greece. Okay, so then we also made this pie chart. It shows the company revenues by the different divisions of, from their last fiscal year. So as you can see, um, medical imaging is the highest revenue. Um, we were focused in pharmaceutical sales. We were working with the directors of that um, division. So we were in the pharmaceutical diagnostics. Um, and then they also operate in ultrasounds and patient care solutions. Um, to look at a previous crisis, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, much like our key speaker was saying earlier, if you look at the chart, you can see a significant drop in the amount of people going to hospitals and illness rates. Um, this is due to people opting out of non-emergency non elective surgeries um, in order to avoid the virus. Um, another big thing that they had to deal with were supply chain challenges with um, timely deliveries due to border closures um, and workforce shortages, such as like all the uh, requirements with the pandemic and stuff. So now to talk about some of the responding strategies that COVID, um, that GE Healthcare um, responded with COVID was uh, prioritizing safety. So one thing that we noticed was that they were already very well accustomed to the work from home um, lifestyle. So it was actually a pretty seamless transition um, when everything started shutting down. Um, our two representatives from the organization told us that um, a lot of people were already out of the office at that point anyway, so when the shutdown happened, it was very easy for them. Um, they also were very communicative with the authorities. Um, being a hospital, it's very detrimental to be constantly talking um, with the government and making sure that everyone was on the same page. And um, another thing that they had emphasized to us was their ability to communicate very well with them during this process. Okay, so the first crisis that they talked to us about was the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, so GE Healthcare was um, exporting help, um, pharmaceutical stuff to Ukraine. Um, and just so you can see, this is a chart um, that shows all of the recent attacks on healthcare facilities in Ukraine. So they were having trouble contacting their Ukraine suppliers and getting supplies there. This led to supply chain disruption, and we kind of figured that there was an ethical dilemma here of if GE Healthcare should wait and see kind of like how they can help Ukraine and how they can get stuff there, or kind of take business elsewhere and focus on the sales and the money. Um, so we're going to be talking about our recommendations for this crisis in the next slide. Um, and then really quickly, this is just a really interesting um, visual that we found um, from GE Healthcare that shows just how many uh, medical facilities have been affected throughout uh, the Ukraine and Russia crisis happening right now. So not to dive too deep into it, but 181 documented attacks um, on non-hospitals. So this was really interesting, even pharmacies, blood centers, dental clinics, things that you wouldn't imagine um, were being immediately targeted, but they are in situations like these. And this data is from 2022, so we can only imagine how much the um, attacks have increased, and one in ten hospitals have actually been completely destroyed um, since the war began, so that number is definitely growing since 2022 as well. Okay, so now to talk about our recommendations. We decided that they should try various transportation options. Um, we thought exporting goods to like neighboring countries and then just figuring out smaller ways to get them actually into Ukraine would be a good idea. We did find that other companies were doing this to get things into Ukraine and Russia was kind of intercepting. So we don't know how effective this would be. So then we also thought that they could um, collaborate with shipping experts and utilize AI to find kind of the best ways to do this. And we also thought that if they um, paired up with the United Nations um, 
they could like send those supplies and they might have an easier time of getting things into Ukraine. Um, another way they can help is by adapting their supply chain by implementing stronger security protocols to safeguard the shipments against interference or interception during transit through conflict affected areas. Uh, our second recommendation would be to expand to new markets by exploring new customer bases and seeking sales opportunities elsewhere and also diversifying markets to mitigate risk, which Haley will get more into. Um, so then we looked at the markets that they operate in with the highest populations and we found that they're India, China, the United States, and Indonesia. So we thought if they kind of took the goods that they're supposed to be exporting to Ukraine and kind of like split them up and sent them to the countries with the highest populations, they would still be making the sales and still like retaining the money. And then we also found that they're not really operating in Pakistan, so we thought maybe while they can't really get in contact with Ukraine, they can make a new focus in Pakistan and open a new market. And next we're gonna be talking about um, AI. So we were asked to look at GE Healthcare's AI existing systems and then also their competitors. So GE Healthcare has two systems. The first one is Edison. Without going into too much detail to confuse all of you, Edison is pretty much all of your, your ultrasound, your scans, CT scans, all that other stuff. They help patients um, kind of understand what's going on with their scans. They help um, healthcare workers say, this is exactly what's happening. This AI programming system's helping the various, all, various scans and very complicated things that I have no idea <laughs> about really. But they help um, clinicians just figure out what's going on. It takes like the menial labor out of um, the diagnostic process. And the second system they use is Sky Cybersecurity. Like it says in the names, this looks for cybersecurity solutions. Uh, they look to protect medical devices as well as patients' information from never ending, as Qualico has let us know, cyber threats and vulnerabilities. As we were looking at different AI systems, we were also asked to look at competitors, specifically Siemens Health and Ears and Bayer's Pharmaceuticals. With AI, we found that these competitors were using it in a similar way, although they were taking it one step forward by using it to be more proactive. For example, Siemens Health and Ears uses AI systems to identify trends over the different countries they operate in that can actually let them know where medical supplies and assistance is needed the most and able to avoid potential crises that may arise. With Bayer, they were using it a lot in their drug discovery and their drug developments within their clinical trials. So they're using AI systems to say, is this drug working within their clinical trials? Is it not, why is it not working? Is there a potential new virus or something that we can start making a drug for now? So they were really using it for predictive solutions um, and trying to find innovative solutions ahead of the game. And so for our recommendation, we recommended proactive and predictive AI systems for GE Healthcare. We have two systems. The first is SAS, it's Statistical Analysis or Analytical Systems. It's mainly for and designed for healthcare companies, so none of the other companies here today would be able to access the system. It's called the SAS Institute, actually. Um, it's mainly for insurance and healthcare companies, so they can look ahead and see, you know, is a region having um, problems with some virus or some disease, or uh, is there a new virus like COVID coming up um, that we need to be prepared for? Yeah, another system they could use is Epic Solutions. This is actually used by a lot of healthcare companies as well. Um, one includes a like Harvard program, they use this. Through this, you can actually improve efficiency of different processes, including clinical trials. You can also benchmark yourselves against competitors in terms of operational and financial metrics. Um, and now just a brief conclusion to wrap this all up. Uh, we really wanted to focus on strong uh, proactive capabilities rather than reactive capabilities. So one thing that we noticed was that GE Healthcare had a really good system for adapting um, when things arise, but they really didn't have um, preventative measures of things they could do to um, mitigate the, the um, conflicts that arise when crises start. Um, so with the seamless remote work transition and the cybersecurity measures and the Edison technology that I uh, spoke about, um, we saw those reactive measures in place. However, there is a need for um, proactive management measures with their adaptable supply chain, um, deepening ties within existing markets with predictive AI and with our transportation alternatives. Um, and with this all, we hope that they can um, implement some of these measures and we hope that we really help them. Um, and that's our presentation. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, just a 
Excellent note. Um, I think everyone has done a really good job of talking about both the Hawkeye long-term view and short-term view. I really like to be broke it out into proactive and reactive strategies as well. So I think it'd be a great pitch to GE if you ever did that. So. Thank, Thank you. you. They actually did that. We did. Research. We did. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, perfect. So like amazing. GE executives and these. All of these students have been presenting. You can. These students have presented to their clients and uh, you know like really worked with them throughout the semester and and provided solutions that they were looking for. So um, these are much condensed presentations. Yes, yeah. 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 a much more conducive presentation for the clients. So. All right, next group. Um, we uh, were lucky enough to work with OTE and uh, I am Will. I'm Jack. I'm Justin. I'm Nick. I'm Ben. And I'm Dylan. So our first uh, topic is uh, the influence of OTE on Greece. Um, although we were only there for a week, we really got to see the influence um, OTE had on Greece. Really couldn't walk too far without seeing their logo on uh, the crosswalks and such. And uh, we even went to a Panentiaco soccer game while we were there. And uh, we were able to see that they were the, uh, the former sponsor of the team. So uh, it was really cool um, being able to work with such a great company. Well, so some background on OTE. Um, it's a Greek telecommunications company. It was established in 2008. It's a subsidiary of OTE Group, the largest integrated telecommunications provider in Greece. And it began with Hellenic tele Telecommunications Organization. It was founded in 1949. And they offer a wide range of services, such as internet, data, hosting, and cloud services to its customers. And OTE Globe invests in cutting edge technology and infrastructure. And they're the market leader in telecommunications industry in Greece. So moving on, on top of just a little bit of company background to get to know a little bit more about the telecommunications sector itself. Uh, obviously it's a rapid developing and competitive market across the world. Uh, ranging main services within this industry would be things like fixed and mobile line telephone, uh, as well as broadband internet and television broadcasting. Um, like Ben just stated, OTE is the largest telecommunications company within Greece. Uh, and to look at some of the mobile operations that happen there as well, one of their subsidiaries is Cosmo, um, and a couple of competitors would be Vodafone, Greece, and Wind Health. Um, a couple of main services that OTE focuses on and provides would be voice and data communications, as well as through their broadband internet, obviously internet access, and then past that would be bundled service packages across their all different disciplines. Um, moving forward, a trend that the telecommunication industry, especially in Greece, is looking to do is to move fully to uh, fiber cables instead of copper, 100%, and right now they are 90% of their goal has been reached. Uh, all these regulations and future implementations in the industry are all regulated by the National Telecommunications and Coast Commissions. All right, how can we do a business presentation without going over some boring numbers? I'll do a little bit of OTE's financials. This is from 2022. That was the latest available information we could receive. So some big KPIs that I thought were important, at least to know about OTE. Their net debt was down 7% from 2021. Their revenues increased year over by 3.6%, and then their adjusted EBITDA increased by 3.5%, which suggests that they have smaller operating expenses relative to their revenues. Um, we'll talk about this more in our recommendations, but we just thought it was essential to at least understand their financial health before recommending some of these giant projects that uh, we think could benefit them in the future. And then as a from customer acquisition standpoint, they've been doing a pretty decent job. We have said that they are the majority uh, market shareholder in Greece. I'm pretty sure they are responsible for something like over 90% of all of Greece's um, phone and telephone industry. And with those stats, you see TV subscribers increased by 3% year over, as well as mobile subscribers increased by 3.8%. So we didn't have much recommendations for the company when it comes to um, customer acquisition marketing. I think they do a fairly well job, clearly dominating Greece. And then with these diagrams, I just thought it was interesting to note that, you know, typically you would expect that GDP in the telecom industry to um, correlate pretty directly. Obviously, as your uh, country does better, you expect, you know, more money to be spent on phone and the connectivity of your uh, culture. 
but during COVID, this was actually not the case, and GDP inversely correlated with the performance of the telecom industry. Obviously, people were forced home, but that demand for uh, telephone and internet usage can you continue to increase. And I just thought that this was important to add. I don't know if anybody's businesses or anywhere they've worked has experienced this. I know I have with my last summer at Rhode Island Energy. But often, when your company's doing well and maybe your consumers are doing not so well, maybe struggling financially or maybe just need more help paying off their phone bill, you're going to have a disconnect with your customers. You as a company may be striving, your customers on the other hand, it's going to be a lot of bad blood in that. You know, they'll be at your throat, it happens all the time, people will continue to call you, complain, that stuff. So some of our uh, other recommendations are also geared towards customer satisfaction. Then this is just a map, map of their um, service areas in Greece, or in actually all of Europe. As you can see, it expands way past Greece. Clearly they have a lot in Athens in that area, but they spread into Europe as well, which is strategically beneficial. They're kind of a center point between like Northern Africa, Europe, as well as South Asia. This geographical you know, strategic advantage we also talk about later in some of our recommendations as well. So moving on to the focal point of what our project was about was to look at how they handled the COVID pandemic and their experience with it. Uh, obviously here are a couple of quick bullet points is many things uh, everyone probably can relate with across companies and industries. Uh, we all dealt with a lot of the same struggles. For them, one of the big things was the consistency within the digital society in Greece. Them being able to secure that for them was a tough thing to do uh, with a lot of communication problems going on and other things that were of more importance at times, uh, the help to keep a consistent um, internet and communication network was a hard thing for them to do. Uh, as we all know, increased network traffic and congestion was a tough thing with many people starting to work from home, from their own private, or going to places for public networks was a lot different. Businesses weren't operating solely at their brick and mortar residences anymore. Everyone was working from home. Um, also supply chain distributions for just regular maintenance calls and things, you know, getting supplies and materials and cables for them was a hard thing to do, and you can't help your people if you don't have the materials to do so. Uh, remote work challenges is kind of something I just talked about, as well as the customer service demands. Uh, increased demands with everyone working from home, everyone wanted better options and better connection and better networks, and uh, that's something that they couldn't do also with not having uh, the staff to do it. You know, not having the regulations to let people go out and do service calls, plus people didn't want to go out and do service calls anymore. Um, so that really stunted uh, their growth in that time. Uh, the last two things I wanted to touch on would be then also the decrease in revenue from business customers. This is one thing they talked to us about even before we went to Greece in our initial phone call with them. Um, was one thing they noticed is that certain businesses obviously didn't come back from the pandemic, but certain businesses stopped using their main headquarter locations. And some companies went completely remote. So taking out a whole business and network that they used to provide now just didn't exist. Um, people don't realize and think, yes, some of the companies still go on, but that was a big market share loss uh, for them, especially revenue-wise. And lastly, with the whole thing, with the pandemic, obviously regulatory and compliance challenges were in effect where you couldn't go to work, and if you had trouble you know, getting connections, you guys couldn't all meet at their main headquarters anymore in Athens, um, as well as you know, communication to uh, be able to do these service calls wasn't allowed. So just jumping into some areas of focus for OTs, crisis management. Um, so some recommendations we have are just find clear roles and responsibilities within the crisis management team. Um, they should also implement adequate communication systems and protocols, um, significant training or experience in crisis management, um, and then regularly update, uh, review, and test companies' crisis management plan. can understand that that can be um, quite a difficult thing to do during a crisis, but it is pretty important to make sure you're on the correct path um, with your plan. Um, and then acquisition of resources uh, efficiently um, regarding um, staffing and technology, and then um, support from senior management and other stakeholders. Um, it's pretty important to kind of lean on some people that have had more experience than others um, during a crisis. Yeah, so during our tour with OTE, we actually learned about some of the apps and their communication styles that they use. So one of their most important apps right now is Paisy. 
So this would be like an Apple Pay or a Venmo account. Uh, so they use this to carry out transactions, different types of bill payment, and just other everyday transactions. Um, so they, old, they have over 7 million oil subscribers where they provide customer services and help them carry their banks over. Uh, and so they also collaborate with other companies that provide similar services and other apps. Um, so what they also do is food delivery. Uh, they use Bolt, eFood, and Delivery GR. And these are very popular in these areas. Um, and so they also connect with Amazon, Microsoft, and other schools and universities. Um, and so just looking at some of their reviews, Looking at it, you might think, oh, maybe this isn't a good app or it doesn't function right. But most of their bad reviews actually come from their video registration process, which people say tends to be very difficult or it's a long process pushing people away. And then the good ones say they provide great services, the app works well, and um, it's easy to link banks to this. So um, on our tour with OTE, we got um, uh, a view of the network monitoring center. However, it's like very private and secure. We wanted to take photos, but we weren't allowed to. Um, but OTE Globe basically has um, a network monitoring center to help ensure the performance of their network's infrastructure. And this is equipped with state-of-the-art tools and technology. They even had like a like a movie theater viewing room that we went into and got to overview it. So they have hundreds of screens, and basically what they're in there to assess is the network traffic itself. Um, they're trying to detect anomalies within the data that they're viewing and also troubleshoot any issues that might arise at the time. Um, and this is also staffed by a highly skilled team of engineers and technicians um, that are monitoring it. And this is staffed 24-7, 365. Um, there's never a day where there's not multiple people inside that room at all times. And it also just you know, helps network monitor performance. Um, identify potential problems. So essentially, they're trying to react as fast as possible to what's going on. They're watching the news. They're watching the usage of their systems. They're watching um, political anything political going on. They're constantly viewing what's going on because they have to make split-second decisions. Um, like the keynote speaker was saying earlier, sometimes you just have to act fast. Um, sometimes acting fast is better. Um, and it, again, it ensures network security. Um, you're just constantly searching for any signs of suspicion um, or any sort of security threat. So one of the things we looked at was the telecommunication global leaders. Um, so their top global competitors based on market share are AT&T with a market cap of $138 billion, um, Verizon with $176 billion, and Comcast with $167 billion. So how OTE compares to that and their parent company Dutch Telecom um, OTE has a market cap of 6.3 billion, and Dutch Telecom has a market cap of 111 billion. So OTE makes up a pretty significant portion of Dutch Telecom's market cap. And it's also important to note that uh, the revenues for OTE in Greece that that is very significant to them. So the people there look as look at them as one of the industry leaders, um, and their subsidiaries like Ben was just saying, Dutch Telecom. Uh, that also brings in, having a multiple of these subsidiary companies brings in lots of their uh, profit and revenue over the years. Uh, and so some of the common crises that OTE has to deal with, uh, so just like two or three months ago, um, someone was set to go drilling uh, for one of their cables, um, and he was actually at the wrong location, it was a miscommunication, and he ended up hitting one of the main power cables, taking out the internet for the day. Um, and they told us this would be an example of something that's a minor problem, only because it only takes about two to six hours for them to go and fix this. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, they had a mobile station that had a small explosion. Uh, so the fire had taken out a lot of their equipment. Uh, and the problem with this is, is that these mobile stations are so far away that it costs so much money even just to get there or set up everything there. Um, so this is why it would be a major um, crisis to them, which they would also deal with immediately. All right, so obviously we talked quickly about kind of a more customer focused recommendation with um, trying to continuously improve their app. You know, that was mostly based off of their customers, not switching to a recommendation that's more infrastructure based. Um, we were lucky enough to be connected by DAS to an industry professional in the United States that actually works in the telecom industry, and he discussed some potential. Um, 
opportunities in this industry that their company in the United States has been looking into. So the most interesting to us was the data center, data center industry, specifically made notorious from its use in like the Scandinavian countries. During COVID, they set up these big embassy, almost like towns of data centers where they've had a ton of different buildings. Obviously it's a little bit colder over there, so it's better for um, you know energy bills and stuff like that. But they set up these big towns of data center storage facilities and they'd sell them off to different companies, and not only companies, governments as well, took a great interest in buying these products. So that was very lucrative for these Scandinavian telecom companies that set these up. They were selling um, their facilities to major companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, stuff like that, and as well as big governments. And just with that data storage market general in general, it's projected to grow from 218.3 billion in 2024 to 774 billion in 2032. So obviously that's not, you know, a small amount of money. This industry is grabbing the attention of not only governments but big companies like Microsoft and Amazon. We did recommend that it is something that at least OTE looks into. Obviously it is very expensive. Athens specifically would probably be too warm to set this up, but in northern Greece, the temperature could still be um, suitable for these for these facilities. And then also, like I showed with that map, Greece is pretty centrally located to the point where they could offer this product to a wide variety of different governments, corporations, and organizations kind of across the globe. So we recommended, you know, with this rise in demand for cloud and quantum computing, you know, I think it'd be a great, at least, starting point for um, OTE to at least consider setting something up similar in Greece. And then additionally, some other tech trends that we saw within the industry that we uh, recommended to them were open and virtualized RANs as well as the Intelligent Edge. Let me, let me start with the Intelligent Edge. I think I'm more interested in the virtualized RANs, but the Intelligent Edge would just be focused on you know, like I was saying with quantum and cloud computing, staying at the edge of that, you know, innovative processes. So the analysis of data and development of solutions at the site where the data is generated. Basically, the whole um, investment into this would be to reduce latency costs and security risks. This stuff all will be passed on to the consumer, which goes along with our previous recommendations. You want to keep your consumer happy. You want to offer the best product that you possibly can. Therefore, they will uh, send it in return and give your company some better sentiment. But then as for open and virtualized RANs, this was like a really cool idea that is kind of hitting the telecom industry right now. Um, I want to say it was like Ernst & Young that I looked at their research on it. They called it a disruptive technology, which is always cool for a company to hear. But basically, the whole gist of it is, like Dylan was talking, supply chain and logistics became a huge problem in COVID. Especially with the telecom industry, you got some of these, you know, telephone poles, some of these under underground pipes, where you know one little thing breaks, you got to go through the whole system, go back to square one, replace everything down the line. Could turn a ten thousand dollar project into a million dollar project. But with the incorporation of these open and virtualized RANs, which are radio access networks, it would allow for a variety of suppliers to produce like a similar product that can be. Um, mesh together with other suppliers. So practically you can have one little part from one supplier, one from another supplier, one from another, and all those um, technological equipment will still mesh together perfectly and still work. So this can save a lot of money by diversifying suppliers and not having to worry about, you know, oh, it's gonna take three months to get this part. We gotta wait three months now before we can fix this, you know, crucial problem. It's like we said, Obviously, it's not the healthcare industry, but with the telecom industry, it's still important to get your uh, services up and running. You don't want people without phones, without internet. Could be life or death for some. Obviously, not as important as healthcare, but but still important. And so, our our recommendations to OTE um, for how they could have better managed during COVID or taken some opportunities even during COVID because they did such a great job in the first place um, would be to enter the data center or embassy industry in northern Greece. The second would be to supply cloud and quantum computing services. 
And then the third would be invest in future tech trends such as um, RANDs or Intelligent Edge. And then um, for their app, Paisy, it would be really important if they were to enhance uh, their customer support and cost efficiency, um, try to get the uh, video setup figured out for the verification. That would really help their customer reviews and just really help their consumer base. And then also flexible, flexible payment options. So we all know during COVID, um, people lost jobs, people were laid off, um, people had reduced hours. And during this time, um, OTE didn't offer any deferred payments or flexible payment options um, for their customers. And they have such a large parent company they can lean on. We thought it would be very important um, for them to um, offer these such things to keep their customers happy which is very important. And then lastly, um, an increased focus on cybersecurity. Um, they have had cybersecurity like, threats in the past and they will continue to have them as they thrive. So it's very important that they keep focusing on that. And that's our presentation. So it is uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker for today. And uh, you know, uh, Mr. Basim Nassim is gonna be giving us a talk, the title of which is Leveraging Science, Engineering, Data Analytics and Technology to Create a More Resilient World. Now, could you have asked for a better talk to end all the presentations that you guys have been talking about? But you know, what's more important is that uh, uh, Bazin works as the Chief Digital Officer of FM Global. And for the last 25 years, he has been a leader in the field of thinking about digital solutions to crisis management and uh, all different kinds of things. And FM Global is, is a company in Rhode Island. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure a lot of you know about it. It's a, it's a Rhode Island company, but this is a, a company that leads the world in insurance of uh, crisis. And it's a very interesting space to be in. And Bazin is one of the biggest leaders in that company to think about the future uh, in that organization. He has worked very closely with MIT and at Harvard, and he's worked at other universities to work on this idea of digital solutions. So I think it is going to be a really exciting way for us to close what has been a wonderful day, uh, not just hearing our first keynote speaker, but also all your presentations. And now I feel like this is all going to come together. And, and then we can continue a lot of discussions about all of this in our lunch and maybe even in a Q&A. So thank you so much, Bazim. He has an amazing uh, uh, biography, which I'm not reading right now, but all of you have that in your program so you can understand the depth of his experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone. So I was told you're graduating in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. yeah. Woo right? Yeah. Yeah. They have to be final done. exam. No, 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 they're <laughs> final exam. <laughs> You think you're done, right? I'm here to tell you we are about to start the real, <laughs> the real world, the real environment. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you, Basim Nassim, Chief Digital Officer at FM Global. I've been working for this company for 21 years, um, and it's a, you know, a lot of the content I have today I've borrowed from uh, content that we would normally share with our clients. So there's a little bit of marketing, you know, in there. But I'm here to actually reveal to you the, the content, not necessarily the, the marketing piece of this, but that was my disclaimer before we get started. So um, some of you may be familiar with FM Globals, others may not be familiar with FM Globals. So this is a quick kind of overview of what who is FM Global and what they do. So like uh, it was mentioned already, uh, this is a company who's really it, it's an insurance company, but it's a very unorthodox insurance company because the majority of the employees are actually engineers, scientists, and technologists. So we have very little uh, underwriters and very we have no actuaries. So the makeup of this insurance company is completely different than your traditional insurance company. So it's a mutual insurance company that makes them even more unique. That means this company is owned by its clients, and that's it. So that's a really good arrangement because you know if you're a publicly traded company, um, you're under a lot of pressure depending on what's happening in the market and who holds your shares to kind of respond to your shareholders. That pressure doesn't exist within this organization. It's a simple, the policy holders, the clients are the owners of the organization. That means we don't have to worry about anything other than serving our clients and doing great things for them. That's the only kind of source of pressure. 
company was founded in 1835, so it's a very, very old organization. Believe it or not, the founder of this company was the guy that invented the, the sprinkler, uh, and he kind of came with that um, loss prevention philosophy, and he started with kind of looking at biggest risks to kind of secure and make more resilient. And that concept is embedded, this concept of resiliency, that's embedded in, in the culture of the company, in everything they do, and that will become very uh, apparent very quickly. Um, so it's, it, the, the clients are, think of the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 1000. Uh, in addition to that, we do a lot of work to strengthen and make community resilient. So that including uh, ensuring key high-profile universities, key high-profile uh, hospitals and healthcare institutions, and, and, and. Um, 5,500 uh, 5, employees worldwide, uh, 50 offices worldwide. The, the financials is one year old, so the surplus now is over 20 billion. Our premium revenue is over 10 billion dollars, and uh, assets is even greater than this number. Now here's the, the pink uh, box, 68% of clients have been with the company for more, more than 10 years. And that's kind of very unique in the insurance industry. And that has to do with the topic of your symposium today. How well this organization does in handling crisis management and handling crisis in general. As you could imagine, based on your experience with insurance, whether it be car or home or whatever it is, that you have insurance policy for, the number one reason a customer or a client would leave an insurance company is when a loss takes place and that loss was not handled appropriately. So the reason why the clients are very loyal and stay with the organization for a long time is this theme of effective risk management and effective crisis management. Um, and um, I'm gonna move on to kind of talk about the secret recipe behind the success of this organization for years is that integration or that fusion between the science, the engineering, the technology, and the analytics. So there's a lot of practices, there's a lot of good process in place, but what's really fueling that is that sense of innovation and the attitude of like, we're here to solve problems and we're here to make our clients and the world more and more resilient. So you see that as a theme. So. Um, the company has few subsidiaries, organizations. One of the subsidiaries organizations and organizations headquarters in Norwood, Massachusetts called FM Approvals. And this is a unique entity that is, its mission is to improve the engineering standards globally, worldwide. So they would deal directly with regulators in India and in China and Asia and Europe, focused on kind of raising the bar when it comes to engineering standards and um, you know guidelines to kind of build facilities that are more protected, uh, more you know uh, secure, more resilient from that perspective. So um, what, what the center of this innovation is a facility in Gloucester, Rhode Island, uh, called the FM Global Research Camps. Some of you, if you probably went on YouTube and you Googled or, or you searched. FM Global Research Camps, you'll come, a lot, a lot of, you'll come across a lot of content. I'll share with you just uh, an overview, but this is really a center for innovation. And it's very, very uh, unique for an insurance company to own anything like that. And because in these centers, in these labs, we really design and innovate when it comes to how we problem solve around this concept of crisis management. So each organization, each client is unique, what they do is unique. Every client will bring their own challenge in terms of what potential crisis they could come across. From natural hazards and disasters to fires, if you're in a manufacturing facility where you're dealing with a lot of plastic and paper and things like that, to pandemic, to cyber, uh, mining, sites, explosion uh, sites, and all of that. That's kind of the headquarter where that research, that science, that technology is all taking place. This facility has uh, around 300 um, employees that are PhDs you know, in the various disciplines, and that's kind of the beginning of all the solutioning for how you address and how you address uh, and manage crisis for our various situations. 
Now, I have a little video just to give you a flavor of what happens at this facility that I'm going to play for you. Fire, explosion, hurricane force winds, and earthquake are all in a day's work at the FN Global Research Campus, the world's premier center devoted to preventing physical threats from turning into real life catastrophes. The simulations conducted here help clients prepare and protect their facilities before disaster strikes. The campus is comprised of state-of-the-art laboratories, each focused on a specific hazard, fire technology, natural hazards, electrical hazards, and hydraulics, as well as a dust explosion bunker. Testing conducted here helps clients understand the risks and to visualize it in a safe and controlled environment. So this is kind of quick. Uh, one minute video to kind of make this real and to kind of sh show some visuals of what really happens at that research facility and that's every day to day kind of activities or actions. So I really liked your presentations. I love the, the keynote speaker this morning and uh, there were a lot of good themes that I could take away from your presentations, from your learning when it comes to kind of principles to how you uh, would kind of approach a crisis. Um, the top three for me was communication. You know, communication is really essential. The second one, um, this concept of, I'll say in my language, planning the work and then working the plan or being ready to pivot when the plan does not get you to a place where you are ready to reach your final destination. So that ability to pivot in a structured, you know, calculated manner is really key to your ability to manage that crisis. And then there's the preparation, or what happens during the peace times. Now, in leadership, there's two schools of thought. You know, some people are referred to as peacetime leaders, and some people are war times leaders. I happen to believe all the war times leaders are really good at crisis management because how they invested in peace times, how they were prepared for the wars. And that's kind of the, the, at the heart of what we do and what you're about to see. So the rest of the presentation is really talking about different solutions for different type of risks and different type of, re, uh, of crises that you will come across. And it's all about how can you be prepared to address. And some part of this preparation is to be prepared for what you don't know, because these things will be dealt with during the crisis as well. So let's walk through some of these examples. Our so virtual fire scenario on fire. in direct collaboration with our engineers can help you visualize the potential severity of a fire hazard and the impact of completing our various engineering recommendations. The fire tool leverages FM Global's advanced computational fluid dynamics modeling, supercomputing resources, world-class fire testing capabilities at the research campus, and our extensive experience in fire protection science and engineering. By exploring common storage and manufacturing configurations, you'll see the impact of different fire protection and storage arrays in side-by-side -side fire simulations. The fire tool provides the ability to build a fire scenario that most closely represents your storage array and commodity at your facility. As a result, you can see how various storage methods and sprinkler arrays would respond in the event of a fire, helping you optimize your fire protection. Here, we'll show an example of a fire loss simulation. Without automatic sprinklers, you can see that this warehouse and its contents are severely damaged within the typical response time for fire departments. What if the recommended automatic sprinklers were installed? You can see that the fire is quickly controlled by the automatic sprinklers. Only a few commodities are burned. With customized insights and data, enriched with our loss prevention expertise, we can work together to strengthen your business resilience. The capabilities we offer today will continue to grow to meet your business needs of tomorrow and provide the proactive partnership you deserve to help your organization build resilience and be prepared for the future. We're looking forward to helping you and your teams along the way. Let's get started. Okay, so this is a solution that is built to kind of help clients understand their fire risk. So think of a manufacturing facility that is full of plastic or paper or something that if a fire takes place, 
that will be the reason why this will be a total loss, right? So when when some scenario like this emerges, you know, naturally we all gravitate towards what can we do to be prepared if this scenario does emerge. Without actually lighting the place on fire, there's an element of you don't know how plastic will behave. You don't know how everything will behave. So we take on that research, that science, and then we have the ability to simulate that same exact facility with the dimensions, you know, with the characteristics of that facility, and kind of really understand before a fire takes place, if a fire happens at this specific location, that's exactly what you will see. And this is based on uh, tests that run over and over and over again. Why is that critical? It's critical because once you know you could convince um, a, an organization to kind of sprinklers are really important, you know, but it's hard to comprehend because of the cost associated with installing sprinklers. Once they see their, their facility and how everything would actually respond to that scenario, they say, oh, sprinklers are, you know, are not expensive at all and then you know visualizing that risk and communicating the risk is kind of really really important to kind of preparing everybody else to responding to that crisis <coughs> so um, I'm going to move on to climate and um, I, I know there's a, a lot of stuff going on in this space right now but FM Global including science data research engineering have developed a really unique suite of products to help clients be pre prepared for climate risks and climate kind of catastrophic uh, event. So um, think of an organization where uh, we could send our engineers out to the various facilities that this organization owns and has where the engineers would walk the facilities, kind of document what they see, the characteristics of the location, what it's capable of, what is uh, what it does exist and what doesn't exist when it comes to protection of this facility. And then at the end of these visits, the engineers kind of issue a list of recommendations similar to what you all did on your project to kind of make those facilities and those locations more resilient. So that would be one aspect of this. Um, those reports or that product of a climate risk report, that would have to, that would address what happens to my Marriott chain of hotels that is right in front of the ocean if a hurricane hits today. Then we move on and we say, okay, well let's understand science a little bit more. If the trends in science and in climate change continue to evolve at the same pace, what would be the risk of not doing anything about that risk now? Five, 10, 20, 30 years from today. Understanding that will help also the client to kind of formulate their perspective. Uh, and then we have something, one of the projects talks about, uh, talked about recommendations to kind of change certain sites or expand in different geographic regions. We have something called the Resiliency Index that kind of studies the globe. Uh, and depending on the business that you're in, it would kind of have a resiliency score. Is that a good place to do business in? And it's looking a lot, of, a lot of things, including uh, climate factors, including uh, political factors, including uh, a whole slew of different risks, and then presenting recommendations about where should I go to expand my facility if there's a problem in supply chain or things like that. And on top of all of this, and that's the strength of that mutual concept, uh, the mutuality aspect of the business model means that if we are if we make profit, if we make profit margins, the only beneficiary of this is our clients. So part of this effort is we take out of our profit and we give back to our clients to implement key recommendations that will help them to strengthen their climate uh, risk exposure. And you'll see a quick video that kind of tells that story um, a lot better than I just did. It is changing. We see it in the increased severity of windstorms, floods, wildfires, and other natural perils that strike the places where we live and work. Now is the time to take decisive action to protect your properties and business operations against the impact of climate change, to protect your assets, profits, reputation, and market share. While others talk about the problems of climate risk, FN Global has solutions today. We have a suite of climate resilience products that can keep your business going strong. 
Here's a closer look at the suite. The Climate Risk Report allows you to focus on your location's risks. It's customized to help you understand your current climate risk based on location-specific data collected by our visiting engineers at your facilities. The data collected is converted into an actionable and prioritized set of recommendations. The Climate Change Impact Report gives you the power to look into the future and understand how perils such as extreme precipitation, wind, temperature, drought, and sea level rise could affect your locations. Working with your client service team, you can use this report to help take action now to manage future risks. The information you get from the Climate Risk Report and the Climate Change Impact Report will not only help you assess and prioritize action to mitigate climate risk, but they will also help you with reporting such risks and actions to your investors, employees, and communities. The Climate Reporting Aid shows you how to use the risk profile information for your climate-related financial disclosure report. The Resilience Index ranks 130 countries and territories based on the resilience of their business environment, providing you with high-level insights into how climate risk and other key drivers could impact your entire supply chain in the regions of the world where your business operates. In combination with our natural hazard maps, the Resilience Index identifies potential risks to your suppliers and helps you evaluate the risk of acquisitions or expansion. Finally, we understand climate risk mitigation often means significant capital investment. To help offset the financial implications of implementing a climate resilience strategy, in 2022, FM Global issued a first-of-its-kind resilience credit, a premium return designed to help you complete climate-related risk improvement. This unique credit reflects our mutual structure and is a demonstration of our commitment to help our clients combat climate risk. Used together, this product suite provides you with a high-level view of climate risk around the world, helping you evaluate the current climate risk at your facilities, measure potential future impacts of climate change on your facilities, support your ability to manage and mitigate these risks, and assist you with public disclosures as you progress on your journey to achieving climate resilience. While the world around us continues to change, FM Global still believes that most loss is preventable and climate resilience is your path to competitive advantage. The FM Global Climate Resilience Product Suite, tools you can use today to help you invest for a more resilient tomorrow. We can change the future. We can show you now. So again, that conviction, that philosophy that we can change the outcomes of a crisis is really something that is at the heart of everything that motivates and inspires every employee uh, in this organization. So obviously this suite of climate products have won many innovations. This is one of them in the industry that was high profile. And then we entered the area of cyber. There was a lot of discussions on cyber today, one of the major risks that you would ever have to deal with today. And we also have a very, um, engineering, scientific oriented set of solutions and assessments that will help our clients mitigate their cyber risk. Uh, similar to the other risks and the other type of crisis, I have a little video that kind of communicates what this uh, specific solution will do. Safe from cyber attacks are the systems that run your facility. It may seem like these systems are completely isolated from the outside world. But in reality, the networks you use to run your business can provide direct access to your industrial control systems. And because these systems often run critical equipment, they can severely impact production if compromised. Email, remote access, and other services can provide a pathway into your most critical equipment. Our analysis of client losses shows that the majority of cyber attacks originated in the IT network. From here, they move throughout the networks to eventually impact the operational technology network, commonly referred to as OT. And this is where an attack on your industrial control systems can lead to physical damage to equipment or product. FM Global's new information security assessment is designed to evaluate IT as a vector into OT. In other words, it identifies vulnerabilities in your IT network that could be an entrance into your operations facilities. 
And just like with other threats to your business, FM Global provides recommendations to mitigate those risks and better protect your most vital pieces of equipment. Threat actors are constantly probing networks at organizations just like yours. And cyber attacks are increasing in their frequency and sophistication. Let's look at a real cyber attack that impacted one of our clients. Take note of how our Information Security Assessment, or ISA, follows the same path the attacker takes to compromise networks. This cyber incident began with attackers using a stolen account to log in remotely through the organization's virtual private network, or VPN. The client did not require multi-factor authentication for this access, so the attackers were able to gain access into the IT network with this compromised account. Once inside, the attackers identified an older version of software that stored passwords without encryption. They were able to access those systems and download hundreds of accounts to be used in later phases of the attack. At least one of the accounts had administrator privileges, which allowed them to easily move from system to system. From there, it was very easy to identify and impact the OT environment. This client did not have a firewall to protect the production facilities, so the attacker had a wide open path into their most critical environments. Both IT and OT systems were targeted with ransomware, and the results were devastating. Recovery efforts spanned across four months and impacted nine manufacturing locations. The in-process product had to be destroyed. This resulting physical damage cost the organization approximately 1.2 million US dollars. When coupled with the loss of sales, cost to rebuild systems, legal fees and cleanup efforts, the overall damage was much greater. This real world example highlights how FM Global's information security assessment could have identified vulnerabilities these attackers used to disrupt operations. The actionable recommendations resulting from our assessment will help build resilience against attacks like these. And unlike other cyber risk assessments, FM Global's ISA is designed to align with our industrial control systems evaluation to give you a view of cyber risk across your entire organization. Each assessment focuses on protecting the equipment critical to your business and reducing the risk of damage caused by a cyber intrusion. Protecting your property has always been the number one priority for FM Global. Whether the threat comes from fire, natural hazards, or cyber attacks, we are constantly working to understand and reduce your risk. With FM Global's information security assessment, you can prepare for constantly evolving cyber risk. For more information, please contact your client service team. So this is it. Um, um, the, a lot of these solutions, you know, again, the result of direct collaboration with clients, with individuals that are accountable for managing and maintaining crisis if these risks emerge. And uh, really, they exemplify that mindset of like, there's a lot we could do to be prepared for a crisis, and there's a lot we could do once a crisis is here to kind of be ready to respond to these, these crises. And um, the, the last thing, all of this is our, we talked about the, the vast majority of the employees are engineers, so this is just the, the, the result of this model works of, you, focusing on resiliency and focusing on engineering and prevention. You could take this from the insurance industry to apply it to healthcare or other concepts, but to, to the best way to mitigate the risk of a crisis really focus on prevention and building resi resiliency from the get-go. Um, with that, we have a suite of data analytics that makes use of all the data, the test data, the engineering data that is gathered in the field that guides and uh, our clients to kind of make the right uh, decision at the right time for their business. And the final kind of uh, uh, believe is we're here to kind of 
protect today for a better tomorrow. So we start by kind of believe that the majority of losses are preventable, and we end by saying, and if a loss didn't happen, we are protecting today for a better tomorrow. So that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, a quick drive-through uh, view of various solutions uh, in the space of uh, crisis management and risk management. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Great question. So I'll answer this in two ways. There's kind of the, the frequency yeah. of these crises and losses, and then there's the severity of those crises and losses. So in terms of <coughs> frequency of losses, probably the losses related to cyber attack is high frequency now. There's, uh, so that's, that's one. Uh, fires, anything that's related to human error, you know, those are kind of the high frequency losses. The, the natural hazards, even though they're fewer in between, the magnitude and the severity of those losses when a hurricane kind of hits an entire region is a lot greater than these individual high frequency losses. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. Yeah. What else? Please. Um, you mentioned that you guys had field engineers that would go out to different sites. Do you typically, are those people all typically from FN Global in house, or do you guys contract with third parties for that? Yeah, there's no contracting whatsoever. All of these are FM Global employees that have to kind of believe in that philosophy that we're here to protect these facilities. And these are our partners and our owners, so we have that mutual partnership. Um, and we do that not only by sending these engineers to these facilities, but we do that through uh, deployment of technology. So we have access to uh, aerial imagery and satellite imagery and these field engineers are licensed uh, uh, drone pilots where we could actually uh, depending on where is the facility where is the region we have different ways and means to gather these engineering data to help us collaborate with the client on how can we best protect that facility and make it more resilient over time Please. For your tenure clients, how do you approach the crisis management, risk management conversation as this changes year to year or even in 10 years, 20 years? Like? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, very insightful question. Um, unlike most of insurance company, uh, FM Global wouldn't just insure anyone. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of organizations that would love to have us as kind of, you know, their insurance company. If we don't demonstrate this philosophical alignment, when it comes to the philosophy of loss prevention and the, the philosophical alignment that we're here to work together to kind of implement changes today before a crisis takes place for the purpose of having a better tomorrow, that we will not work with you, we will not insure you. So that's kind of what differentiates. So again, because we're not, you know, the profit goes back to the client. Uh, can you imagine the risk of including a client there's now an owner of the company that is behaving in less responsible way, and the end result is having an impact on all the other clients or all the other policyholders. So that's why it's a very insightful question. We are very careful um, who uh, would come in to kind of be a partner or an owner or a client, and that's kind of what makes us more resilient over time. The company's been profitable, been around for a long time, and that's kind of the key ingredient. Um, we don't have a lot of clients. So the, the number of clients is like close to 1,500 clients, and, and that's why, um, so I appreciate the question. Please. I, I think to say FM Global is an insurance company is an understatement. <laughs> because essentially, I mean, at least from the finance perspective, you, have a, you take the risk as given, and you pay a price for the risk to insure it. Now you are actually fundamentally changing the next year, reducing the risk, preventing the that, that you, you got it. You, you absolutely got it. So it works completely different than the insurance model. So the insurance com company is profitable, 
when it gives its client as much of a hard time as possible when it comes to handling losses so they're not paying out as much money. This company, the reason why you know, I'm there for 21 years is you know, that tension goes away. The, the reason why we're in insurance is to kind of help you mitigate that risk before that risk emerges. And if you really buy into that, you know, hopefully you'll never pay any losses or you know, when mother nature hits and it's outside of our control, you will prepare it for kind of losses. There's an example that I could recite, um, the last hurricane that hit Florida. Uh, there were two hospitals that were serving uh, one community. And one of these hospitals were an FM Global 10-year client, and the other was not. And our engineers, the, the hospital did some work in terms of renovations and installing some new cooling units on top of the hospital. Uh, so like we always do when, when something like this structurally significant, they will reach out uh, to us and they say, hey, it would be good to have your engineers come in and just make sure everything is good. That was one week before the hurricane hits. You know, the engineers get on top of the roof, they look at the cooling units, they say, oh, there is a problem with these cooling, cooling units and how they were installed, we need to secure them. But also the roof is um, getting old and we need to have another engineering recommendations that you should really consider respond to sooner than later to kind of do something called tightening the roof, which is without bombarding you in a lot of details. Let's say a roof has a nail, um, you know, the, uh, every like certain amount of dis distance. After the roof gets a little more deteriorated, it'll be a lot easier depending on what pressure in the outside, what pressure in the inside, wind speed, science, other factors to kind of lift up the roof and toss it away, the more the roof is deteriorating. So the engineers made a recommendation that is easily to implement, but just go on top of the roof and uh, tighten the roof, mean inserting more nails between the distances uh, of the nail. They did that, the recommendation was implemented, uh, two days before the hurricane, and then uh, the hurricane takes place. And it was one of these moments where we really kind of, you won't comprehend the impact of science and engineering until you see that. You, we have the images of the two hospitals before, and there's two parking lot in front of the two hospitals that were kind of equally populated. And then we obtain the images of the two hospitals, the two locations after. And you see the first hospital was not insured by FM Global. The roof is completely gone. All the windows are gone. The parking lot is empty. You'll see the, the, the second hospital, everything is intact. The parking lot is full because now this hospital is open for business to serve the needs of that specific community. So that's kind of, that puts a heart what we do and how we do it because it's not necessarily just about profit and anything like that. It's about these moments where you are building resiliency in the community for all of us to be successful. So from that perspective, going back to your initial question, it's really a very unorthodox insurance organization when it comes to that philosophy. From the revenues perspective, what is the split between, let's say, pay this consulting fee versus actually receiving so 80% of the profit that was made was given back to the clients. So that's kind of, so you know, think about this for a second. 80% of the profit margin is going back to the client. That will motivate the clients to kind of, especially if they buy in that philosophy, to implement recommendations and move forward on this concept of building resiliency all around. So that, that's why it works. If, if you, it doesn't work, to the earlier questions, if you now have clients that are coming into that portfolio that are not behaving in the same responsible manner. Um, and to some extent, the more they behave responsibly, the less profit that creates for FM Global. Because the reality is the premium you pay for a risk that is uh, very unlikely to experience damage is different than the risk that is, oh, if a, if a, if a crisis took place here, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money to kind of get this facility up and running. So it kind of works the complete opposite from what an insurance, what a typical insurance company uh, behaves. Please. Um, considering there's like 1,500 different clients and there's a profit share, do you find that there's collaboration amongst the clients alongside of Global? Absolutely, so 
again, our board of directors are made of the leaders of these clients. So that means um, whether it be financial challenges for us, whether it be a new opportunity for all of us, that collaboration is at the heart of kind of decision making and the governance of this specific organization. Uh, you don't see, you know, from my perspective, I think we need more mutual organizations and less publicly traded companies, but uh, it works when you have that collaboration and partnership for the mutual benefit of all parties. It doesn't work or breaks down when somebody is really a big winner and somebody else is a, is a big loser. Awesome. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. I love the engagement and the question. Good luck with everything from now till uh, the end of the semester and wish you the best on your new journey. Remember, you're not done. You're about to start. Thank you again. <laughs>